Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Professor Maggie Livingston. I'm the faculty director of the DePaul Center for Animal Law, and I want to welcome all of you this afternoon to our program, which is the second in a series of four programs we're having this year on companion animals and the law. And this session is devoted to the exploration of the legal and social and veterinary issues associated with puppy mills. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers. And I'm going to hand it over to my associate director, Brett Davinger, who will make introductions and do some housekeeping stuff about the and all of that. So. Well, uh, housekeeping stuff first. If you need the course evaluation form for the written material, they are in front here. I will give CLE certificates at the end of the event. I'm going to be early, in which case, come to me and I'll give it to you when you leave. Um, puppy mills is one of the biggest topics in the animal welfare, animal welfare field, and it has been for years. Um, they became especially important this year in Chicago due to, the, due to the passage of the Companion Animal and Consumer Protection Ordinance, as well as the subsequent injunction. But we'll get to that later in our final segment. Uh, first, some background. Even though there is no legal definition for puppy mills, and there are rabbit mills and kitten mills as well, there are some common features associated with these facilities. They are commercial breeding operations where breeder dogs, which can range from as many as 10 to 10,000 pets, live in unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. They often live in tiny cages, uh, without adequate food, water, or shelter, little access to veterinary care, and no socialization opportunities. This can lead to serious health and behavioral issues, which will be will also get you later. According to the HSUS, the country has nearly 10,000 puppy mills that produce nearly 2.5 million pets a year. These dogs, which number of thousands in Chicago alone, are often sold in major pet shops and online. While almost half the states have laws regulating commercial breeding operations, these are rarely, these are difficult to enforce. Today's session will look at the various aspects related to the puppy mill controversy. Our first panel will be a focus on reporting, which will give us an idea of the public's attention towards the subject. Our first guest is Sally Ho, a reporter at the Chicago Tribune. She began her journalism career at the Chicago Sun Times overnight wire service. After spending some time at the Oregonian, Oregonian in Portland, she returned to Chicago and joined the Chicago Tribune, where she covers education and policy issues in the home of the Heights and the Northwest suburbs. Uh, and now I will give it to
to reference this type of um, abusive animal breeding, mass breeding facilities as a puppy mill because it's now become synonymous with both the movement um, and also that's how the average reader, you know, um, recognizes and understands the issue. And although the activists really have made this a fight about animal abuse, the ban itself um, is just as much about uh, the government's role in regulating the free market and people's buying choices, which is essentially the basis of the federal lawsuits that have been filed. Today I'm going to go over um, how far reaching this story is, uh, especially in our Chicago area. The Cook County saga in particular has been pretty epic by suburban city council standards, which is not very high. Um, but it's also really just a good case study of the issue too. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about how we tried to move, we as Chicago Green tried to move the story forward um, with the live chat that we that kind of brought up some interesting characters. Um, I guess my first disclosure is that I, I have never had a pet. <laughs> so I have neither neither um, went, gone to a shelter or bought from a pet store. Uh, so I'm very objective about this. <laughs> The Best Friends Animal Society keeps a really great list of governments um, that have adopted retail pet sale bans, including when it was passed, when it was implemented, as well as the full language of the local law. Um, by my last count, it was 67 jurisdictions in the U.S. and Canada that have these local laws. Um, and it's pretty interesting to see the cities that have these laws in the books that I was able to kind of um, picture to kind of get a, a better sense of, of what this is really about. Um, so we saw that Randolph, New Jersey, a very small township of just about 25,000 people, um, is one of the most recent ones to adopt it. They approved something <coughs> last month, um, September 2014. Albuquerque, New Mexico is, is the trailblazer here. They adopted the first um, known such law in 2006. Um, Los Angeles, California is the largest city with a ban, and Florida has more local laws on this than any other state. And perhaps not surprisingly, the states that are known for so-called puppy mills, like Missouri and Pennsylvania, um, they don't have any bans. <laughs> so that's because, you know, the breeders in the pet industry, um, they're not taking this laying down. I mean, they have deep pockets, and they're filing lawsuits, and, um, you know, they're really putting in they have a dog in the fight, if you will. Um, for those watching kind of this anti puppy mill movement that's been really had a great year the last year, a really um, explosive year, uh, I think all of us are really watching the federal lawsuit in Phoenix because it was filed and um, it's pretty far along. It, it will definitely set the precedence on the legality of this type of ban um, that's not, like I said, that some of the pet industry believe really limits the market. So all that is to tell you that it's a big hot story for the media, for myself. When I when I when I make, you know when we see something like this, we think, God, this is you know beyond newsworthy because it's kind of got all of these hot button things that we look for when we decide whether to cover a case, whether to cover a story or not, and you know government, activists, business interests, lobbying is a huge one. Um, not to mention, you know, a lawsuit against the city or the county is usually a huge um, red flag for us to cover it, as well as a federal trial. And, of course, most importantly on this list, puppies. Everybody loves a good puppy story, so uh, we really jumped on that. Puppies really do get everyone interest. Um, I'll tell you, I write a lot about a little everything, and um, from my experience, people are more interested in a story with a pet than really most other kinds of stories. And that's, the, that's evident in this story in particular because, um, all things considered, it's really, this, this law is really affecting, um, it's really a policy within very low-level government. I mean, we're talking about Arlington Heights, we're talking about um, <coughs> Orland Park, we're talking about these towns who are taking on this, you know, national movement um, that frankly probably don't have any business doing it because their animal control is not, you know, up to task for, for regulating something like this. 
Um, and, and in addition to being pretty low-level government policy, it also doesn't really affect the taxpayer directly. I mean, the taxpayers themselves, they might be animal lovers, they might be interested, but they really, um, it's really not about them. And, and in cases like that, it's pretty rare that, that a story would get so much coverage and that it you know, really doesn't affect the taxpayer directly. No single person you know, is going to lose any money. Um, so, um, yeah, so the point being that there are a few things that people get riled up about when you write about it, and Clinton Lewis has become one of those things. Um, for example, I recently wrote about low-income children losing um, school lunch benefits because I'm an education reporter primarily. I didn't get any calls, I didn't get any, you know, comments, but I wrote about this puppy mill story and in my inbox the next day after it printed, you know, I had people leaving me messages and telling me about their experience but on both sides, you know, getting the dog from the shelter, getting the dog from um, a pet store and, and kind of the good and bad in that. So um, really all of that was to tell you that the heart wants what it wants and that's why we covered the Pokemon. Um, so the anti puppy mill movement, as I said, has really had a banner year, um, especially in our Chicago area in 2014. The city approved a ban in March that is supposed to go into effect next March. Um, and Cook County was very far behind. They approved something in April for uh, what was supposed to be an October 1st implementation. Uh, it, it, that implementation, of course, is now delayed because there's now a lawsuit in question. Um, and then also Naperville, one of the largest uh, suburbs in the metro area, has been considering an independent ban um, themselves for months now. Of course, everybody is kind of on hold and holding the breath to find out what, what is going to happen in Cook County. Um, meanwhile, and this hasn't been as, uh, as thoroughly reported, but the state has picked up on this too. They, last year they approved the Puppy Lemon Law, which protected pet owners who got sick pets from stores. <laughs> Um, but in August, just a couple months ago, the state actually increased the fines for violations to the Animal Welfare Act. And it should be noted that the face of that law in, from August is three third graders from Arlington Heights, Illinois. Um, you know, they apparently had learned about puppy mill abuses and called their state rep, like you're supposed to do. Uh, and, you know, was really the force behind this law in particular, and it was really um, pitched to the media, and certainly, um, you know, that story was about these kids wanting to fight puppy mills. Um, They're future politicians. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, those kids are paying attention, for sure. Um, so, now, if, what I talked about, newsworthiness, I mean, the only thing readers love more than a good pet story is a good kid's story, and these kids were pretty adorable. Um, so it's just a good story all around, and both the Puppy Lemon Law um, and the State Law and Fines, those were designed to be complements to this puppy mill movement. Um, I, I, there's been talk about a puppy mill law statewide that hasn't gained a lot of traction, as you can imagine. Um, but it was, you know, it's certainly been talked about a lot. Um, basically, I'm trying to tell you that everybody was trying to get in on this action this year. With the Cook County case, um, I'm, I'm sure there's a reason why they're not here today <laughs> because they don't want to talk about it given that it's pending litigation at this point. But there was a lot of going, uh, a lot of stuff going on with the Cook County ban. Um, and if you can believe it, the approval process itself was extremely political. Um, I know it's hard to believe. But uh, to give you some background and some context, that ordinance uh, was approved about a week after it was introduced. Um, in April, and it completely skipped the committee process, uh, which probably, in most cases, for a bill like this, would have gone through a committee process. Um, but critics, because of that, critics complained that it really only gave the public, you know, three official days of, of public notice for public comment. So in June, these two <coughs> county officials who were upset about it were so mad, they actually approved, they actually voted on a new uh, on a new rule that virtually requires every <laughs> every ordinance going forward to have to go through committee, um, and they you know they did this as really a direct um, 
is a direct reaction to what happened with the Puffin Model Ban. Um, the interesting thing is, is that it, they were only allowed to do that, to, to call for an, uh, an immediate consideration, because there is a, a law, there is a rule on the books that says if, if, the, if, the, if the board agrees to do it, then you can have immediate consideration and things like that. Um, that was meant for these uh, emergency situations. I don't know what the emergency situation was at the time, but from what we know, you know, most do, most people thought this was really kind of this do-gooder bill, and that it would, it would be pretty pretty simple. You know, the conversation like who who could be against a puppy mill like that, right? That was kind of their logic that they didn't think that it would be um, so controversial and didn't really require kind of this committee uh, committee input. Um, but so it skipped committee um, in April. By June, there were there was this backlash um, over over that move, um, and then of course the uh, bill itself. You know, I, I I would say most people that I talked to virtually agree that the Cook County ban is is not a good ban because of the language. It's too vague. It has a opt-out clause, things like that. So even advocates of the puppy mill movement say, okay, this was not the best um, written and best thought out uh, form that they could have had. Um, and of course, a few pet store owners sued anyway because they felt like it was, um, like in the Phoenix case, they felt that it was unconstitutional to limit the market like that. The Cook County State's Attorney, which is the county's uh, lawyer, um, is defending the county in this case, but they pretty much admitted that they weren't informed on the issue. They weren't consulted um, it, as the bill was being passed in a week. So now they've agreed to delay the implementation <coughs> until the judge rules on it. And this is so the pet stores can stay open while this is pending in court. And also, I mean, it lets the state's attorney or their own lawyers to catch up because they weren't very much informed at the time. Um, and in fact, it's in court today, so we might hear something about it very soon. So the Cook County um, ordinance had an opt-out for individual cities. Um, cities with 25,000 people or more, they're known as home rural communities in the state. Um, and that basically grants them a, a lot of leeway to create their own rules. It's a fairly common clause for a policy like this. Uh, like the puppy mill ban, um, given that Cook County is, is actually pretty limited in its legislative powers on these individual jurisdictions that are home rule, which many of them are in the middle area. So Orland Park chose to implement its own regulations. Um, instead of an outright ban, they came to this compromise that it was just going to be you know, stronger disclosure, more disclosure, signing off on so that you know where your pet came from before you buy it. Uh, Bridgeview adopted kind of a general opt-out. They said, we just don't want anything to do with this. And um, that was because there's only one pet store in town in Bridgeview, and the mayor essentially said, we trust this guy, and we don't think we need it, so we're gonna opt out completely, so he can stay in our business, he's a neighbor of the store, you know, he's not one of these conglomerates or whatever. Um, so that's, that's how they felt about it. Um, interestingly, Hoffman Estates, um, they said they were asked to consider a ban. A pet store owner had gone to them and said, can you please opt out so I can stay in business, which is generally how these, have, these have, uh, cases have kind of unfolded in individual cities. That local pet store owner in Hoffman Estates was one of the plaintiffs in the, um, in the federal lawsuit. Um, but Hoffman Estates hasn't approved anything yet. Um, meanwhile, the village of Arlington Heights, as I said, um, this is the reason why I've been following this case, is because you know, Arlington Heights is really in the middle of a lot of this action. Um, a business owner named Ron McBurney, uh, he has five area pet stores uh, called Happiness as Pets. Uh, and one of his stores is in Arlington Heights. So he had asked the village to opt out of the ban. In September, so that he could stay in business, 
at the, at the time, um, Arlington Heights, by the way, is again where those three elementary school girls mm -hmm. are from. So this has really become, you know, sort of a point of pride for those local officials that it was really, you know, their kids who, who uh, got it approved. So it, it's a point of pride for this village as well. But back to the point, Mr. Burney's uh, other pet stores are also in Naperville, Downers Grove, Lombard, and Orland Park. And Orland Park is the other Cook County um, store that he has that would have been affected. So on the same day, Mr. Burning was kind of making his pitch for mercy from the law. He said that he's, you know, very reputable. He does all the right things. Um, at the same time that conversation was happening, he also filed this federal lawsuit against the county. Um, and you know, they were saying that the, this law is unconstitutional because it is overly vague, violates the Commerce Clause um, by interfering with interstate commerce, provides unequal protection, impairs business contacts, and would essentially put them out of business. Uh, the Interstate Commerce Clause is in there because the Missouri, Missouri Pet Breeders Association is, is also a plaintiff in the case, and it's because that state association claims that Missouri is, has the largest amount of pet breeder activity than, than any other state, and that most of its business, uh, most of its pets go to out of pet stores, pet stores from the state. Um, so during this kind of action-packed day, um, the, you know, while Mr. Burning was making his case to the village board to get an opt-out and filing the federal lawsuit, um, Arlington Heights officials actually didn't know about the lawsuit. In fact, most people covering the story of Arlington Heights dealing with this didn't know that there was a federal lawsuit filed. Um, because obviously that really changed everything about, about his request. Um, but Arlington Heights did end up that night get, granting him a reprieve, temporary reprieve, just so that he could stay in business while they um, investigated the case and things like that. Like I said, he, this is a low-level policy um, that you know most of these cities aren't really equipped to handle. They had no idea what, what most of this meant. Um, so they themselves said, okay, we'll give you this, we'll give you this opt-out temporarily, but we're gonna look we're gonna at it again. Um, and you know, by all means, he made a pretty convincing argument to be able to get that temporary reprieve, Mr. Burning. Um, because many of the trustees, you know, a lot of these um, city councilmen in these towns, they're the lawyers, so they themselves have said, you know, they really slammed the county down and said this was poorly written and we don't understand it. Um, at the same time that they were praising his business, he had been around for 15 years. Um, but the dynamic kind of changed when a woman named Diane Arp of the Companion Animal Protection Society spoke in public comment um, and basically refuted everything he said. Everything Mr. Burning said, this woman got up and said, you know, it's not true, he's been investigated for bad puppies, um, and, you know, we've been investigating him for years and things like that. So, um, that's also, you know, along with this low-level policy, there was also some low-level excitement there because uh, it's just not every day that you cover a suburban city council meeting and there are people straight up calling each other liars on the, <laughs> on the public record. I mean, it was just, you know, this like explosion of something you just don't see every day in the suburbs, frankly. Um, so, again, Mr. Burning was claiming his business was as good as it gets. He said he had the dogs get phenomenal care and showed all these pictures and things like that and he had a full warranty. And Ms. Arp had said that, you know, that he had been investigated a ton um, and in fact has had several complaints filed with the state against him for bad puppies. So this exact back and forth, this exact dynamic that I just described that, you know, was kind of, you know, a red flag for any reporter, it also happened in Orland Park and in Naperville. So together, the Tribune, you know, we realized we have all these reporters in different bureaus across the metro area, but we, we sensed that this was going to be a big thing, you know. One guy, you know, multiple pet stores, this activist basically chasing his tail and going wherever he is mm -hmm. to stay on the public record that he was a liar. Um, so that's when we kind of, it kind of all gelled, because we were like, okay, this is happening a lot, it's probably going to be a big story. Um, 
So what we did was to try to move the story forward, this was, I, we hosted this uh, live chat, which reader engagement is really important as a media organization. We want readers to be loyal and to kind of get a sense of who we are and know that you know, we are tracking the things that they care about. So we had this um, live chat that um, happened kind of in between when Orland Park was going to pass something and um, right before and right before the the um, the judge ruling, the judge mo the motion in court that would delay the implementation. But I brought the live chat concept to the Chicago Tribune because it had been something that I had done a lot in my old job as a reporter at the Oregonian in Portland. And uh, yes, it's true that that is where people, young people go to retire. So it was uh, you know it was just something that they were that was really used to, and so we were able to do that in these live chats, which we call. You know, TL talk uh, for Trib Local Talk. Um, it was to move the story forward, and it was supposed to be this you know virtual conversation, just to hear from our readers what they were thinking. Because um, oftentimes we get a lot of you know mail or calls, but um, you know it's a it's it was an effort on our part to kind of listen to them at once. You know, to kind of have a virtual party so they can vent about how they felt about the story. Um, so earlier this year, we also did one on the lawlessness of BYOB policies for your own bottle. Um, so it, it, it's a, it's usually we do them a lot for kind of hot topics that are going to spread. Um, for this, we invited all of the big players in the Cook County case, um, but only Orland Park, the Orland Park trustee, was the only person brave enough to kind of. <laughs> Go go uh, before the people and, and talk on the record. Um, so he he was in the hot seat, but he was a really good sport. So that was a really interesting um, dynamic because it was just a couple days before they were going to pass their own ban. So he was able to kind of tell us a little bit about that. Orland Park in general has really been seen as a leader in in the unfolding of the Cook County ban because they were quite ahead of it. So we set up five questions to ask readers and engage with them by retweeting at them, tweeting at them, or tweeting at them, retweeting them, and also following along to what they were saying. So how many of you guys are actually already on Twitter? Yeah, so probably about a little less than half the room. It's really kind of the wave of the future. I mean, it's for, for news people at least, because it's really, um, you know, you follow all these people and you get a news feed. It's kind of like an RSS feed for all of these you know, topics or people that you regularly read. So I encourage you to try it out. Um, so among the discussions, among the things we discussed about, you know, we tried to not just talk about what we had already reported in the story, but be able to talk about other things um, that were related, but you know, a little bit far off to be able to put in print. Because um, you know, unlike the internet, the actual paper has, has a space issue. Um, so the first thing we did was, you know, we laid out the social landscape because, you know, what is the experience like of buying uh, from a puppy from a pet store? Because, like I said, I have never had a pet, so it was just kind of those curiosity things. And a lot of these people who make these laws um, are, are a bit removed from that the actual experience. You know, they they might not have had a dog in a long time, and just might not be aware of kind of the puppy the, the anti puppy mill movement. Um, so, we, you know, it, and, and um, the other thing is that uh, during this policy review, they had really said, well, it's really not going to affect a lot of people because there are only, you know, 16 pet stores in the city and 13 pet stores in suburban Cook County that would be affected. So that was kind of their, their thing that, oh, it's just, it's, it's only 13 stores, so clearly it's, it doesn't even warrant community discussion. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of threw that out there. It's just like, what, what is the social landscape here? Why do you decide to get a dog from a pet store versus a, um, versus a shelter? And we had one reader who said that he still thinks there's a stigma about buying um, a shelter dog. That a lot of people still prefer purebred um, and don't want older dogs, which is often what is available in shelter. Um, he said people still want the golden doodle puppy, which in my head, I never had pets, is you know, common from Full House. So that's what I was thinking of when I said that. Um, and then we talked about you know, the business landscape. You know, 
if people mm -hmm. still want purebreds, um, where where is the if people still want pure, if it's true that people still want purebreds, then why is there why does there appear to be so much support for people who get a shelter dog? You know that these that really you know it's it's if you adopt a dog, you know that's that's a really good thing, right? And it's like a volunteer thing, and it's you know I mean I don't think anybody looks down on somebody who gets a shelter dog, but um, so we kind of talked about that because there was also this you know on on the business industry side they were really saying that. Uh, you know, there's always going to be a demand, and if there are no uh, USDA regulated pet, you know, pet breeders, if, if they don't exist anymore because of this puppy mill ban, um, then they'll just be a black market, and then it will just be unregulated. Is, is their point? Um, and, and you know, conversely, you have to ask yourself if most people are starting to get their dogs from the shelter, isn't that you know kind of a supply demand, a natural supply demand thing? Like eventually, there just won't be any more pet stores because everybody's going to choose. You know, everybody's going to presumably become informed and educated and choose to get a dog from a from um, from a shelter. Um, so you know, the question becomes: Can the free market kind of do good on its own, um, or you know, kind of work itself out, or is that unrealistic? Um, and that you know. It, it's clearly a problem that, that really requires a law to fix it. Um, it's like I said, some did say that it's clearly a problem if you know these USDA regulated breeders, um, even though they're licensed and they get um, and you know they get uh, with those meetings and regulation things. Um, that if those guys aren't good enough, then isn't that a problem with the USDA system? Not so much with. Uh, not so much with the pet store itself, but, you know, their argument is that you're really punishing the pet store for something that the government should be able to deal with um, before it gets that far. Um, another another we, reader we had said that uh, vets should be a bigger part of uh, the conversation. And then we had another, the other side that said, well, these vets are often in the pockets of these pet stores because they, you know, they say, yeah, we'll pay for your vet appointment to make sure your dog's good. Um, so it was just this constant back and forth, which is what made it um, kind of interesting for me anyway. Um, there was also mention from our readers that, you know, all this ban will do is force these pet stores to move across the border, that they'll start opening in DuPage and Little County and other counties that, you know, Lake County, um, who don't have the ban, which is just, you know, a poor business decision, essentially, is what they're saying. Um, and the answer to that for the advocates was that that's why a federal ban is, is uh, required. So I would have on that. Um, one of the things that hasn't really been a part of the conversation or the coverage in, the co uh, in any of these pet store bans is enforcement because you can have you, know, you can have this, but how how are you going to make sure that people are following the law? I mean, are you going to check every puppy and who's going to pay for that? Which then would affect the taxpayer individually. So that's kind of something that we looked at in this in this uh, virtual talk. Um, because if you read these bans, it's pretty it's pretty interesting that that uh, not most of them do not have you know, any straightforward answer on how they're going to make this happen. <laughs> how they're going to actually regulate this, this new law that we have. For example, in Orland Park, when they were kind of considering all this stuff, when they were still open to the idea of a ban, um, it, you know, according to their estimates, they would have to hire and train a part-time uh, puppy mill ban code enforcement officer um, to Basically, figure out, you know, learn, learn the ropes, learn the laws, go around, check, check and make sure that, you know, they're following disclosure, that these, you know, puppies did not get from the puppy mills, uh, were not, did not come from the puppy mills, and things like that. Um, and it would have cost taxpayers for that part-time law enforcement officer $27,000 a year. So that's when it becomes, you know, a, a bigger deal to the taxpayer and has broader, you know, kind of broader impact. Yes? I'm sorry, I didn't understand that the, the, the Orland Park would have to hire a part-time person? Or the yeah, county? yeah, so because they were considering, uh, they, when they were considering their, With, their For one pet store. For one pet store, exactly. But 
I mean, if you if you look at like restaurants or any other business you regulate, I mean, they don't go in there every week and check on them. Right. I mean, that's absolutely true. I mean, these were all of the things they should have at some point thought about or you know figured out and put into the van, but they hadn't, and so it was left up to. Um, it was left up to Orland Park to decide, well, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to handle this? Because, you know, I mean, it had been this hot topic, so they couldn't really, you know, half-ass this thing, having... But, it, but I guess been, my, my problem with it, though, is if, if you opened a restaurant in Orland Park, they wouldn't say we need to hire a part-time person because we had opened a new restaurant, and we're going to need to inspect them. So for one business, that seems a little ridiculous. It's, it's not so much that there was one pet store, it was that they needed a singular person who was trained, you know. They, most, um, these communities have their own health department, so they might hire, you know, one or two, depending on how big their city is. Somebody is trained to go to a restaurant when they suspect a problem, to be able to say, okay, well, you're violating, off, you know, you're violating all these codes. In the case of the puppy mill, that person didn't exist because there had not been a ban. So it's just because the law was new, and kind of so out of reach for, like I said, a lot of these, you know, it's a low level policy, but it was also extremely complicated. And so for them to be able to actually truly and honestly enforce this, which is not always the case, I mean, let's be honest here, it's not always the case that people truly and honestly enforce a, a, a code amendment. I mean, suburbs have, you know, thousands of them. Um, but in this case, they would have had to hire somebody, you know, at least to work part time to, learn the stuff, be able to handle a complaint. Um, and, you know, with, with Mr. Burning, he had been complained about a lot. So it's, you know, if they, ha if they didn't have anybody, uh, you know, basically on retainer to figure it, to deal with it, then, you know, that would have been a problem for them as well. So, did, was there another question? Um, so from as far as I can tell, the compromise so far is really between the business interests and the um, advocates has been just stronger disclosure. And you know, as far as I know, there's always been disclosure requirements, but you know, they kind of up the ante and said, okay, well, if we can't have a ban, then we'll settle for more disclosure. Um, finally, we. we Finally, we looked at this kind of at a macro level. It's like, you know, you have this huge puppy mill movement that I'm sure you guys are, have all heard about um, and have been paying attention to. But at, at the end of the day, is the pet, are, are pets really better off with these bans? Are, and how do we know that? You know, how is it possible to know whether or not pets are actually better off? How is it possible to know if the pet owners are any better off? You know, I'm sure there are still pup, sick puppies being sold. I'm sure there's still very healthy, happy families out there who buy from a pet store. So it was just this question of, you know, are, how do you know, and is there a way to track um, are fewer pets being put down, or you know, are still are people still finding pure, you know, problems with purebreds? You know, has has there already been this like black market for uh, purebred puppies that we don't know about? Um, you know, in response to some of this stuff. <laughs> So like I said, we invited all of the big players in the case to join us in the live chat. Uh, we invited the Cook County government, the Arlington Heights government, the Puppy Mill Project, which you'll hear from a little bit later, um, and the lawyer representing the pet store owners in the federal lawsuit. Earl Park was the only one who was brave enough to come talk to us um, to answer questions live, um, which is the other good thing about Twitter, is that you can kind of have this real-time conversation about you know something pretty serious, um, if it's being you know posted by a Chicago Tribune or something like that. And I know um, the companion companion animal protection society, Diane Otter, she you know I invited her to come be a part of it, and she she told me she joined Twitter and figured it out just for the occasion. <laughs> so we were quite pleased with that. Um, and. A, a member of the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council, or a member, or somebody who gets their emails, apparently, um, had contacted me and told me that they had sent out some blast email, letting all of their national members know that this was happening, um, encouraging them to, you know, be a part of our conversation, so that, um, 
so that their side could be represented, some business interests could be represented, which, you know, to me is just, you know, really funny that these guys in, you know, these lobbyists in D.C. feel that this is so, you know, our little story in Chicago would be of national interest, but that kind of, you know, ties it all up. This is a story that, you know, the industry is paying attention to um, as much. Um, I will say that overall, we probably had about two dozen people participate in an hour. Uh, we weren't able to kind of follow every thread because it, it, you know, some people kind of went off the walls there. But it was, by and large, very civil, which you really can't say about most online um, interactions. So it was very, it was very civil because we really made it clear up front that this was not a conversation or debate about animal abuse. I mean, nobody thinks it's good to like, kick your puppy and do bad things to them. So we tried to focus it on the ban itself and kind of that unfolding. Um, but of course, like any public forum, we kind of, you know, we had a lot of colorful comments. We had a few really sad stories about sick pets and irresponsible pet stores. Um, there was also one person who seemed to make these like really extreme um, comments, like cage the puppy mill breeders, <laughs> which you know to me it didn't really add substance to the discussion, but. I, I described it to my editor as, you know, she's kind of being like drunk mom at a party. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was pretty fun. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Do you guys have any questions? Overall, um, did the public seem, well, overall, what was the public sort of response to the puppy mill ban? Were they for it? Were they against it? Or was it, like I mentioned, because it's considered vague? They didn't really have. They didn't really know where to fall. Um, I I think, like I said, because this story, I mean, at at the heart of it, the average Arlington Heights taxpayer doesn't really care, frankly. You know, they, this is not unless they own a pet store, unless they are really entrenched in the movement. You know, and this is pretty common for a story like this. Is that you really hear from kind of the competing interests. You hear from. You know the DC lobbying group for the pet industry, and then you hear from you know these big nonprofits that have you know a real mission to defend the movement. So I think the average person, I, I would say that probably everybody who participated in our live chat or, or kind of commented, they weren't just like you know some you know soccer dad who happened to read it and was so like excited about puppy mills. He most of the people who are speaking out are going to have their own interests. Sure. Um, you mentioned that uh, your, in your opinion, the free market is not um, sufficient in and of itself to take care of the, uh, the problem with puppy mills and that legislation is needed. Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, what I, I didn't say that as my opinion. I was, you know, I was this is, I was trying to explain that that's what some people were saying, that this was kind of the argument that, the, you know, if indeed puppy mills, this is their argument here, but if indeed puppy mills are so terrible, eventually they'll be out of business because people are going to stop buying from them, right? Supply, demand, it'll eventually go away, it might take time, but that's kind of their excuse. Is that, okay, you're saying that shelter dogs are the only way to go, but clearly that's not the case because a lot of people are still buying from pet stores. I mean, how do these pet stores stay in business if, you know, if indeed it's true that, that the shelter dogs are, you know, are becoming so much more desirable? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Do you plan to have any more of these um, tail talks depending on as we, Yeah, they, they kind of just happen, um, they kind of happen when we just recognize the story and that's not always the case. So. Um, for for this, you know, I, I don't know that we'll do it again. Maybe if there was some like huge development. Um, so it kind of it kind of depends on what it is. Our our last chat is archived on our website, so you're welcome to kind of read through it and be able to see for yourself um, some of the fun stuff that we were talking about that day. Yes. Um, in your opinion, do you think this like debate is going to continue to rise, or do you think it's something that's going to fizzle out on a local level? I um, I think I think once the president has been set in court, that will pretty much take care of it. I mean, I you know a lot of these suburban communities, rightfully so, um, are you know they don't want to get caught up in a legal battle that they can't win. 
I mean, you know, they're they're being represented in court on taxpayer money. Their lawyers are paid by my taxes. So, you know, to be a you know financially prudent, they 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 usually don't pick up fights they can't win. So um, I think it'll depend on what the president when when and if the president is set. Um, I think it's completely possible that that will happen pretty soon here because we now have several federal lawsuits that are pending. So eventually somebody, some judge somewhere will decide something and then everyone will say, all right, fine. Um, they'll probably go to appeal, but you know what I mean. Like that, that will really set the tone for this movement. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank
20 years from now, we'd all like to look back, and we know it's going to happen. We're going to look back and we're going to say, thank God we don't have puppy mills anymore. I can't believe the way we allow people to treat these dogs. They're enslaved, they're in prison, and this is man's best friend. You will typically smell the facility before you actually walk near the cages. It's fairly common not to be able at first glance to tell which is the front end of the dog and which is the back end because the hair and the mats would be so severe. But you can't even tell the animal's looking at you first. She just sat in the corner and shook, uh, basically for four months. And little by little, she came around. It is the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. So one of the requirements of the testers is, oh, we don't sell puppy milk dogs. We only buy it from the responsible breeder. The fact of the matter is, no responsible breeder would ever sell a dog to the pet store. When you buy a dog to the pet store, you're paying an actual and you're not paying an actual care of the Most of the dogs, the majority of the dogs that we wanted to help are called animals. They never got the room that they deserved. The corporation, their interest is making money. Their interest is not in the country. Their interest is not what is being made in the Most of that opposition, quite frankly, is coming from huge agricultural groups and industries. These are groups that have nothing to do with dogs. Community interest is zero. How do you run a government when the voters go to the poll and they vote in something to do As public, we have the ability to get informed and we have choices. And I think we cannot just ask others to do it, but we are willing to be open to this cooperation. What keeps me hopeful is everything comes down to the public. It all comes down to the public and the public awareness. Uh, what we do as consumers, what we do as voters, what we do as advocates for the animals. And it's such a simple thing. Find out who the legislators are who support animal issues. And if they come after me, then come after me. I don't, I don't fear anyone. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Chris Soule, and I want to um, share with you how this became, um, why there's a film. And I, by day, I'm, I'm a banker at Wintrust, so I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a documentarian. Um, but I have dogs, and I have three dogs and three fosters right now, and one's, one's adopted though. So, um, but I, what, how this all came to pass was I had a puppy mill dog, and he had a lot of psychological issues, and I thought, oh my God, if I don't keep this dog, something bad's going to happen to him. So I made a commitment to Brady, the, the, middle, the middle dog of the three, and, um, but I was like, something's not right here. So just as a citizen, right? I'm doing I do animal well, a lot of animal welfare as passion, but but the puppy mill topic was starting to just really disturb me. Then I got a phone call from the rescue that I got the dog from, and they said we have an emergency. We have a girl who's fostering, and um, she's got two breeder girls. Can you take one? And I said, I don't know what a breeder girl is, but I'll help you. you know, is the girl okay? You know, does she need to stay too? <laughs> I was like, how many? How many are coming? <laughs> so, um, so they they came over, and this tiny ghost shell, 17 pound shell that was barely alive, was put in my hands. And I said, what is this? And they said, this is a breeder girl. And I said, oh my God, like her organs are hanging out. Um, she looks like death. She could barely walk. And the list of things that I saw when I met this dog for the first time, her, it's, there's, a, there's all sorts of technical words for it, but when the female organs, she's been bred so much, it's outside now. She had tract infections. She had worms. She's missing her teeth because she tried to chew through the chicken wire to get out. So she has no teeth except for the front ones. She had um, no fur on her tail. She had bad fur everywhere else. And just the worms alone and the tract, they could have killed her. So this dog was in pain. I said, how long has this dog been in a cage? Nine years. And I said, oh my God, if you didn't, to the rescue woman, I said, if you didn't get her, I said, Beth, if you didn't get her, what would have happened to this dog? Oh, they would have starved her to death or shot her because she can't breed anymore. 
I said, are you kidding me? So as a, and I get goosebumps every time I say it. As a citizen, I was horrified. And then I thought, oh my God, and this little puppy I had, they, he, would, he had all sorts of psychological stuff. To take a year to house train a dog is a long time. Uh, but I can tell you where to buy waterproof stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I can waterproof anything now. But he, so I thought to myself, um, this is wrong. So I thought, I'm a banker, right? We prepare credit memos to go to committee. And I thought, I have to start researching what's out there. What's known about this? Because this is so wrong. And, and then I looked at this dog and I said, I promise you, I'm taking care of you. You're never leaving me. I'm going to make sure you're OK. And then we went on the journey with Kamiko to get her healthy and to make her. And she's really funny now. She's a really funny dog. And I swear she knows when we have updates from Chris because she gets happy and zooms around and howls. So um, she knows. But but so I so I sat in, in the living room with her and I was like, oh my God, I got it. I want I have to do something. So as a banker, I'm just like lawyers, right? You train to sort of make a case. I go to committee with a case file. My case file is a money trip. When I'm presenting credit to committee, I'm presenting a money trip. And I thought, you know what? I have to treat this like a business problem. And I was thinking, what forum? And I thought, okay, it can't be politicians, because I bet they're corrupt. And I'm a little bit afraid of the political <laughs> system, probably rightly so. And I thought, okay, well, obviously, there's, there's not a lot of stuff. It exists, so there's corrupt stuff in here. And I thought, all right, what's the forum to get to the beginning of it? And it had to be the money trail. So then, defining the money trail, I thought, all right, now, well, how do I get that money trail? How do I do that? You know, and as a banker, I sit with financials. I ask my client to talk to me. They're not corrupt. <laughs> so I can take their information. She's thinking, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? So I thought, okay, well, i got to get to the root of this problem. Then I saw Chris Grimes, and I'll, and I'll tell you how I got to Chris Grimes, but I saw his movie, The Second Knock at the Door. And I thought, oh my God, i got to do a documentary. This, we have to uncover all of the pieces of the money trail. Forget the dogs, forget the pet stores, forget everything else. There's a money trail here. Dogs are not being helped. No one's, no one's for puppy mills. That means there's a money trail here. Someone's making money off this. Who are these players and how complex is this? So once I decided that, then I had to pick someone to do this with. And I was like, how do you make a movie? You know? <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, I got to find the best person. I chose someone who is, has no ties to the animal industry because this is a national issue. It's a policy issue, and it's bigger than just the animals. And that's a, it's a common thread in how we're doing this. We, we have no biases. We have no agendas. This is a very pure operation. So I said, I have to pick someone who is a fact finder. Chris Grimes is a genius fact finder. I genius. bring her everywhere. Right. <laughs> he's not my client, just so you know. Just full disclosure, he's not. Um, but he, um, but I am his biggest fan. The, um, so the, the, the thought was that I need someone who can help me route out all of the components of this. What's the undercover show? He has a master's in public policy from Kellogg. That's, as a banker, I'm like, ooh, that's my guy, you know, <laughs> right? So um, so then I was like, okay, check mark on that. Then, then I needed to convince him to do it. Um, and he's not, he was not, wasn't an animal person. Now, you know, now things have looked a little <laughs> I even had his, his wife help me save the pit bull the other night via Facebook, right? <laughs> Lee, Lee was, I, I haven't told you totally how much we've immersed her in that now, but, but the thing was now, how do we, how do we get to really what the story is here? You're hearing all these, fra and fra as a banker, fragments bother me, right? I need a story, I need a cohesive story. And as he and I started talking, I was like, Chris, I'm fostering these dogs, um, and one store's closing, another, and I know as a banker, once you close a store, guess what, it opens down the street. That never is gonna fix the problem. In my lifetime, we, it won't close. So we needed something big, comprehensive, ties all the pieces together, and what I call, this is the outing of the <coughs> head of the snake. The head of the snake is this film. Everybody that has to be gotten to is in our film. And now, when people are ticked off and they want to know which castles to storm, they will know who to storm now. I, my wish is that every Occupy Wall Street angry person 
goes and storms the castle of the people who will be out of it as well. And they're not, it's not the people that they're bothering now. So when, when everyone sees this full story and how it's laid out, I hope now the, all the lawyers are going to be like, bam, now I know, here's a way. The, the, the clever lawyers are going to say, oh, guess what? Get them on tax evasion, right? That's how you get the low-level mob guys to get to the boss. So now let's let all these smart people think about other ways that they can get to cut off the money trail. And once they cut off the money trail, we don't even have to worry about the pet stores. This will be a self-fulfilling domino effect. Because it'll be, when we fix the front part of it, it'll be too expensive. They'll never get out of the mills. And the thing is, if you close the stores, there's still millions of dogs in the mills. No one sees them. So you close the store, you still have millions of dogs being bred and impacted. I know that's where Kamiko came from. She never saw daylight. She never got out. That bothers me. We can't have a solution. Forget the underground and moving around, the dogs that are still in the mills. And on my conscience, I just can't have that left behind as a residual to all of this. So it's not just the end user buying a puppy. It's so much more than that. It's those dogs that you just saw in the mills. So the first thing was we had to chart out what is known. What films are out there? Which films are out there already? What, what do those films say? So what's already said? Now let's get all the stuff that's not said. Let's recap for the general audience enough so they can engage, and then let's tell them the stuff that's not known, and then let's put it together and weave the whole story. And that's why I picked Chris Grimes. His, his first movie was a movie about friendly fire in the military. It has nothing to do with dogs. When you see that film, I sat and watched his film. There was never a voice race. If your 18-year-old son went to war and got shot down by another American, and everyone tried to cover it up. That's pretty emotional stuff. His film tells the story. He made policy change at the Pentagon. And it was the facts were presented in a cohesive way. Right? This, the, 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 the way you tell it matters. When I go to credit committee, how I tell the story matters. My client doesn't get anything if I don't do this right. This is what Chris does that I could never do. So he tells the story. He found the facts. He wove the story together. Then we got the right people to be in it. And the first thing, Oprah's special, right, was the number one thing about puppy mills. Everything that's known about the mills, the guys that Oprah put in her special are the ones who know it. They were the first guys we went to. We said, here's what we know. And they're like, oh, what are you going to know that we don't know? We're the guys. Guess what? They said, oh, my God, you did it. You figured it out. We're on board. And those are the two guys you just saw in the, film, in the trailer. And so they're engaged. Everybody in the film is has has an important role. There is no agenda. Nobody's agenda is in here. Only the facts. It's very clean, and there's nothing anybody can fight because it's all fact based. And that's why I wanted this thing pure. So and Chris Grimes. This is you know I may erect a statue next to Michael Jordan at uh, the United Center when this is all done because he is the Michael Jordan to me of helping get this past. The it's it's true. I can't wait for you to see it. I'm gonna let him talk now. But that's this is you know usually I start sobbing when I start talking about it. And usually I sob when I see the trip. This is the first time I've seen it and I haven't cried. And I watch it like every day. So um, so anyway. So I appreciate your interest in this. Because we want to harness you to be part. Legislation's the only thing that matters. But you can't legislate if you don't know what the full story is. So once we give you that, I hope you guys are like piranhas in a goldfish bowl and just go, oh, here it is. Let's go. Everybody go and do something. So thank you very much. And I'm going to let Chris talk now, but. Cool. You know, I'll talk um, to Miko that uh, we were here. <laughs> obviously, it's great working with Chris um, because she says wonderful things about you. <laughs> so um, I'll start out. I, so my background's in public policy. Um, that was my master's is, and so I'm very interested in complex issues from a political angle, as opposed to really anything else. I mean, I think that there's always a root cause, so whether it be poverty. Whether it be, we're looking at a case, our next film will be about a Philadelphia organization on poverty. My first one was on uh, Friendly Fire, as Chris mentioned. So dogs, when Chris came to me, I was like, you know, there was a really good one on called Madonna in the Mills, where she trapped, showed a rescuer who goes into the mills, 
It was horrific. Most <coughs> people can't make it through it. And so a lot of the public that you're trying to reach, you know, I always say to advocates when I talk to them, is I'm really not trying to make a film for you because you know the problem. <laughs> but that's a, it's a big, big problem in doc filmmaking is that you make a film that's not going to reach your intended audience, which is much like politics. You know, you always know that your your guy, if you're a diehard Democrat or Republican, it doesn't matter if you just say every time you walk into the polls and you pull that lever just for that person and they know that. Do they really care about your vote? No, because you're guaranteed. You already know the issue. You know, you've already decided. I don't care what the issues are. So what I always want to do is, is stretch beyond that. And so when we were looking at this issue, I told Chris, I was like, I don't want to traipse around the mill. I don't want to go undercover. Now, we did that in this, in the end, but I said, let me, watch, let me look for a while, see if I can figure out a way of looking at this from a public policy perspective as opposed to, you know, we've got to show you horrible images, don't buy puppies and pets. So I thought we found something that was running around the industry. So we have a lot of different areas in the film uh, that we cover, but I'm going to focus on three. Uh, to make it easy, and particularly since you're, um, you, know, you know, the political and the law side, focus on those type of issues. So, the first one was how do we define a puppy mill in this film? The basic idea is, is that to a miller, these are numbers. Literally, they do not have names. So, it's just simply a number. A good breeder, and they do exist, these are dogs that go into the house. They're socialized. They have a life that is beyond simply producing profits. So the idea that we define it is, is basically a number to produce profits for a breeder. It's that simple. There's no other complex issue here. So they look at it like a commodity. So the only thing they have to do is to keep the females alive to breed them constantly. Can be up to three cycles a year. Bread, 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 bread. We saw them. This is not the life of a dog. This is not how it should be. This is the factory farming of puppies. That's plain and simple. That's where it is. So that's basically how we define it. So why, who's on the other side of this issue? Who's for puppy mills? Anyone in here? Could I do that at, at uh, Soldier Field on Sunday and ask that question? Would there be a lot of hands that go up after we explain what puppy mills were? So why does an issue that seems so easy, what do politic, politicians love? They love issues that are simple. So why hasn't this been dealt with? This is a federal issue by and large. So it goes back to the AWA, the Animal Welfare Act of 1966. That brought large-scale commercial dog breeders under the auspices of the Department of Agriculture, which, of course, the Department of Agriculture, maybe it's not even in the right place, to be honest, since these are companion. So it goes to the AWA, and that was the start point that got the USDA involved in the large-scale commercial dog breeders. But basically, since that time, there's been no change to federal law in regards to puppy mills. That was a big question. Everyone knows Senator Durbin, right? He's actually in the film. We interviewed him. Do you know who David Vitter is? Vitter's a Republican from Louisiana. Do you, these two folks, do you think they agree on much? Probably not. They co-sponsored PUPS legislation together. The time before that, the previous one, it was called PAUSE legislation, which was to raise the standards up. It was Durbin and his co-sponsors with Rick Santorum. Wow. Now, how many times have those guys ever co-sponsored anything together? So why didn't that pass? I talked to Wayne Paselli, who's the CEO of HSUS. He sat down with us. Um, and I asked Wayne a simple question. I said, Wayne, how many senators our co-sponsors on this bill. And he said, we're about at 62. 62. Now what's blocking it? The idea that the blocking is coming in the subcommittee. What, what subcommittee does any puppy mill legislation have to go through? Ag. Who sits on ag? What states? Yeah. Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri that view these as cash crops. This is not, this is unique, especially in today's world of, of hateful politics. This is not a right-left issue. This is actually a urban, suburban, rural legislative issue. So it's been blocked. So common sense, what I always call common sense dog welfare legislation is being blocked by about 10 senators 
from rural states that are both Democrat and Republican. It's not an issue that you can say, those are the bad guys, these are the good guys. So that's the federal barriers to this issue. So now to bring it to a state level, because a lot of states have attempted to make up for the lack of enforcement of AWA, they've attempted to do it at the state level. So I'll give you one example, which is Missouri in 2008. It was uh, in 2010. It was called Proposition B. This was a major bill that was brought before, sponsored in large part by the Humane Society of the United States. They dumped $1.4 million into the issue. And it was basically heavyweights. One was the Humane Society of the United States pouring money in. And the other one was something called the Alliance for Truth. First of all, I love the name. <laughs> they have alliance. <laughs> what, I mean, I've never heard of an organization be able to include alliance, which they all love, and truth. You know, we're the only one. So that's why I did this film. Because when I started to go into that, I was like, who is on the alliance for truth? <laughs> Who's that other entity? So I've seen a lot of guys, you know, you see these photos of mills, and we went undercover in the mills. These guys are all in overall. But when I saw those numbers, I was like, there are guys in suits that are behind this, that are fighting HSUS, and who are those guys? So if you follow the money trail, I'll use it real simple here. So if this is the Alliance for Truth, this was a PAC, right? They moved money, it was created after we were able to obtain records by trade groups. Trade groups, there were three major ones, pork, uh, soybean. Why soybean? Anyone know? GMO. Yeah, well, well, and also, what do pigs eat? Soybean. Yes, yeah, my major thing. And the Missouri farm. <laughs> so, pork producers in the state of Missouri, massive Smithfield Foods, ever heard of them? They control 98% of the pork market. The biggest player. How are their cows in our cows? Are, is their pork raised in beautiful um, fields? No, they're in factory farming processing plants, right? So, this is the Alliance for Truth. Uh, I believe it's 78% of the dollars that poured into this opposition came from these trade groups. Now, where do trade groups their money from? Do they just exist on their own? Is it just people giving them money? Or is it corporations? The trade groups are the face of corporations. Corporate agriculture. This is Smithfield. This is Smithfield. Uh, Monsanto. All the big players were the ones that were fighting this common sense dog welfare legislation. Now they attack, attack Prop B. The attack was HSUS is coming into your state and telling you what to do. First of all, that is so demeaning to voters in its own. But the other thing is, did HSUS ever hide behind two different entities? Or did everyone know what they're, that they were behind this? Of course they did. Did Smithfield Food make a single public comment on where they stood on common sense dog welfare legislation? Not a one. They didn't say a comment because they didn't feel like they needed to. They created a false group, they funded it with ads, did a whole campaign, the race got really, really tight, and Prop B actually passed them. In the 2010 midterm, which was actually the landslide um, for the Republicans, so it was actually, it was pretty impressive. They won 51, 49%. Big victory, everyone said, finally, in the worst state in the country, common sense dog welfare legislation won. And guess what happened? Legislature went back into session, and guess what they did? They said, yeah, this isn't good. We're going to have to repeal it. They repealed it. A constitutional amendment, they simply repealed it. Now, who do you think was behind that? Who do, who do politicians get their money from? In large part, is it from a lot of people in here just giving their $20? Or is it major agribusiness corporations in the state of Missouri that were providing the funding, they stripped uh, cage size. There ended up being a compromise bill that if you talk to some folks, I mean, it, it, it is a compromise and things are better. There's no doubt that things are better, but the bill itself was stripped. 
It still made no mandates on, there was a limit as to how many breeding cycles, uh, cage size, all those things were stripped. The things that would have really affected the life of a dog was stripped <laughs> out. And it was taken away by the legislator just saying, we didn't really like what the voters did. So that's why we, I decided to do the film. Because when you see something like that, that works against how I believe we're supposed to operate. If the voters go to the polls, and make a decision, that should matter. And it didn't matter. Well, they're supposed to represent us. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so that's obviously not what was happening. Yeah. Well, that's Good. kind of what I was wondering. Like, what is the political strategy behind um, a legislator that is supposed to represent the population when a uh, resolution is passed by the majority of voters who showed this, their support, then the legislature goes, turns around and repeals it? I mean, it seems like from just a numbers game that's, you know, them going against what the clear majority has supported. And so I understand that they, you know, they want the support of these lobbying groups. Yeah. But um, at the end of the day, isn't it the numbers of uh, the voters that who support they really care about? Well, it, they should. <laughs> um, the, there, there's three important legislatures in Missouri. One of them, 72% of the voters in their district voted for Prop B, and he was the vote that he was actually the majority leader in the Missouri Senate at the time. He's the one that voted against it and killed the uh, and was what stripped it. He was also retiring. Guess where he works now? Oh, you think he just went off and retired? Or you think he got a job with the maybe a trader? <laughs> He's with the Farm Bureau. So he knew he was retiring. His name is Victor Callahan. He's a jerk. Um, <laughs> And I actually believe in politicians. I work for politicians. I'm not somebody who doesn't believe there aren't good people in politics. That's not my point. My point is about accountability. So the idea for me was is that the, the, if, if the millers themselves do not, the puppy millers do not have the political dollars to fight common sense dog welfare legislation. If corporate agriculture and factory farming got out of this fight, it would pass. Now, what's their obvious answer, even though they don't publicly say it? Why do you think they're doing it? Because they're next. They view it as a slippery slope, which they're a private company. They're, I mean, they're a public company. Some are private, but they're a public company. They can do what they want. Here's my problem, though. Then tell the people that's what you're doing. So every time you go into a jewel and you go and you buy Smithfield pork, the consumer should know and make that decision. I'm okay with Smithfield being allowed to do what they do. Um, my problem is, is that they're hiding. This is what I would call hiding. Do you think, when I went over to try and get an interview, do you think they, any of these groups sat down with us? No, because they, it, it's not in their interest. You know, so I don't know what's going to happen once we release. Um, you know, we'll, we haven't been sued yet. We weren't sued the first time. The federal government can't actually sue you. So, you know, I didn't have to worry about the Pentagon the last time, but they may, maybe a tactic. Uh, that they attempt. So, so that's basically, I wanted to kind of keep it just to some areas of interest that you guys might have. Obviously, we, we can take any questions. Film will be released next year. Um, we're uh, talking with folks right now, so we feel like it will definitely be out there uh, for everyone to see. So. And you can see the difference, right? All the ch all this discussion that's going on, if those are the issues that are addressed, that this is never going to get fixed. Everyone, and everyone's on the right side of the issue. Everyone knows what's wrong with torturing dogs. But addressing what's out there is never going to get this fixed until we address that. And that's where legislation is important. That's where lawyers are important. That's where groups of lawyers are important and how they bind together. Yeah. Uh, three questions, two, uh, two quick ones. Uh, one is the third group, the Missouri something or other, I can't read. From Missouri here. Farm Bureau. The Missouri Farm Bureau. Yep. Uh, second, the name of the documentary is Dog by Dog. Yes. And third, and this is the kind of deeper question, and you know, I can give an example by example if you, if, if you aren't um, clicking right away when I ask the question. But uh, sometimes you've got all kinds of uh, any type of... Uh, uh, animal law regulation, environmental law regulation, 
really any type of reform in any time of uh, in any type of industry where the reforms proposed, and I was thinking about this when you mentioned the Durban bitter uh, legislation, and you'll get a camp that's against puppy mills, and some some are in favor of a bill that regulates the puppy mill more, so that the abuses or perceived abuses, uh, puppy mills still go on. <coughs> we're going to watch them and we're going to make sure they do those things. Some people will choose not to support that because they're abolitionists. We don't want the puppy mills at all. The, the, le the legislation isn't strong enough. So do you, in your experience, have you seen um, any sector of opposition uh, on that level? There is, there is some. What we did, what we attempted to do right from the very beginning, we attempted to avoid, see, my personal opinion coming from outside the animal welfare movement is, is there's so much division in the animal welfare movement Yeah, and that's between, not, you know, you know I, I'll, I'll give you one that was never mentioned online, we have a huge online following, which has been, speaking of the idea like kids, you know, you know these, this issue that I brought up about like these parents that went through this hell with their kids in the first one, we can't stop people from liking dog by dog. I mean, people really care about this issue. People want to see this issue. Um, so, but kill no kill. Does everyone know that debate generally? You know, you talk about the splitting right away. That's a huge, people won't talk to each other. You know, if they're on that thing. Now for me, coming from the outside looking in, my thing is coalition building. So you have to coalition build around the first problem, which for me is puppy mills, and then when you solve that, then you then you work on where the conflicts are internally. But to throw the bath, you know, throw baby out with the bathwater is one issue. The second issue I think is this idea that the um, that it's um, I just lost my mind. It, and I'm Chris. I'm going to back um, yeah, stop ahead. onto your comment. What you raised was again when I when I said why did I do this? Why is it me and him? You know, it's just it's me and him and a very small group because there's nobody's agendas. And whether I have a personal belief or not, um, and a strong opinion, I have dogs, I don't want dogs killed, that issue's not in here. This is purity of one issue. And we also don't have people in the film who are polarizing in any capacity. This, that's why, you know, people wanted to put agendas in here, like, okay, it's a poppy mill film. No kill, you know, and, and or the next thing, you know, or, or we don't like shelters with cages, or we don't like, you know, there's a zillion different issues. To spay neuter or not spay neuter is another polarizer. So, and then some of the people who want to kill say spay neuter is okay in the reverse. So that was one thing that we wanted to make sure is not in this film. So that just this issue of puppy mills and why is this legislation to help the dogs being blocked? Who's behind it? Yeah, very clean. I didn't want to. Yeah. I didn't want to imply that I'm uh, in no, any no, camp but you're, position. No, no, but you raised an issue that was one of the spine concerns, and we were very careful to make because we don't have any issues now. Personally, personally, I hope this film does something that collapses the whole system and there's no more mills. Guess what I cried about for four days though? I called two of the guys in the film and I said, oh my God, what if we save the dogs and they go into kill shelters? Yeah. And so there are additional things, additional animal welfare concerns. What I hope, we're calling this the journey for change. What I hope this does is I hope people sit and watch the film when it's done and they say, oh my God, we have 15 more issues that stem from this. They're not in the film, but I take the mantle on to address them. Shelter reform, to me, would be a big one. That's not, I'm not, we're not proselytizing in here about shelter reform, right? Not every shelter's a good one. So there are issues that stem from this that I hope then stem back. While this is not a film just for animal welfare community, it's a film for everyone. Yeah. We hope that the journey for change, and Chris is a social policy, that's what he does. We want the film to spur people, like spuds shooting out, going, you know what, I'm going to address this, I'm going to address this, I'm going to address this. No, that's I think, I think information dissemination is yeah. one of the hugest thing in far as uh, 
uh, preserving the integrity of markets and democracy and all these things. And in order to, consumer choice is going to be, should be, one of the biggest factors in, um, in living in the world we want to live in. And, yeah, all People these wanted us to slam breeders in here. I'm not against breeders. If somebody's a small, happy breeder in their house, <coughs> those dogs get treated better than pro usually the husbands that are in the house. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they do. Those dogs have names. Those dogs are beautiful. They're temperament tested. People get a good dog. Those dogs don't go back into shelters. Yeah. And, and I wasn't talking when I, when I raised that question about um, sectors of um, uh, yeah, opposition on the wealth, potential sectors of opposition on the wealth side. Um, I wasn't talking so much about property. I really thought about it when you were talking about federal legislation and, and the ebb and flow of, of support on the federal level. And I, yeah, I, I was wondering that. Uh, the ton of examples, I mean, one is animal experimentation. Uh, anytime anybody's suggesting reforms, you'll have some level of opposition saying, wait, we don't want to reform animal life, we want to get rid of it. And uh, I think on um, uh, factory farming for food, a uh, panel here at DePaul, it was sometime last fall, about a year ago, there's a speaker, Gary Francione, mm -hmm. if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, he, um, he was criticizing uh, the quote-unquote reform movement in terms of uh, more humane killing. He said, wait, um, you know, all, you're doing, all you're doing is yeah. endorsing um, keeping animals in captivity and killing them for food when I'm against that. So I'm wondering how much debate there I'll is take on it. that. I'll take a hit on that. I know. Right. We'll we are take a hit on that. Right. We will. Because uh, to be honest with you, and that's something that's always been kind of important to me. Does any of you normally sleep with a cow in your bed? Probably not many. It'd be hard and annoying, you know, it's a cow. So, but how many of you or have parents or have friends that have the dog that sleeps next to them? You know, dog, the idea of dogs is man's best friend. You know, and so that, there's clearly, I'm clearly making, the, when I came into this film, a distinction between companion and factory. That doesn't mean, because we were outside of Smithfield, that I am for factory farming. But it, it does mean that in this case, I'm focused on this. I think the public views them differently. I think that the, when you look at opinion polls, there's a difference there. Yeah? Do you think that kind of working toward this puppy mill issue could bridge that disconnect? I think once you solve this, but the, you open perhaps the, the worry is not just a, a legislative kind of domino effect that you know we're next because you set this precedent and then they're going to come after our pigs, but that if we could stop puppy mills and kind of you know expose this you know as really just bad behavior and we shouldn't be doing this to animals, that maybe people can can kind of bridge that gap between, okay, this is a companion animal being treated that way, and that's really terrible, we don't like that, why don't we like that? And then it does kind of lead you down this path of, well, we treat a lot of other animals that way, and why do we draw this line? That, that maybe these um, special interests are kind of concerned, you know, not just in a legislative way, but in an emotional level, too, that Definitely. people might you know, kind of fall down that slippery slope. And I, as a believer in free markets, I actually don't think you can regulate your way out of a supply-demand problem. And so that's where education comes in, is that we have to educate the, the person, the people out there. If you buy a dog in a pet store or online, you are supporting puppies. It's that simple. We saw the tractor-trailer routes of hunt deliveries because they have to file federal, the tractors that leave hunt, which is the largest middleman in Missouri. It's actually the largest middleman in the country. Breeders sell them, hunt, ships them to puppy stores up there, right? So we, we didn't obtain, but working with HSUS, they obtained the federal uh, driving records of hunt trucks, and it showed where they're going. So if you don't solve the education issue, the idea that we're going to have, you know, in, in, a, in a time of austerity at the federal and the state level, that the solution is going to be in the regulatory area, you're going to get closer, and I believe that we have to hold those accountable. But as one example, so the USDA just added internet sales under their purview of puppy mills. They couldn't do it by legislatively, they did it by regulatory, regulatory change, the AWA, right? And so. 
they have in total, they have 919 inspectors across the country that do large scale dog breeders, circuses, zoos, um, uh, this marine parks, uh, state fairs, um, and now internet sales. Now, if that's not blowing smoke up your ass, <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, honestly, there was no change. There's no further funding. I, you know, I asked Durbin about it. He was happy that they made the change, and Durbin said to me, "You know, we're going to keep an eye on it and stuff." But I mean, it was almost like we were winking at each other, like wink, wink. This isn't going to do anything, you know, because there's no, there's no money going towards it. So you know what they're going to do is they're going to find a big, a big person who they can show sold a lot of them, and they'll close that guy down. They'll bring the cameras out, everyone will get on board and be happy and excited, but it really isn't going to solve the problem. So they do need more regulatory, they need more regulatory power to close down bad mills, but ultimately it's going to come down to the consumer making choice, making um, smart choices and wise choices to close mills. I think I, I just think that you, you can't regulate your way out of out of this issue. This is just too much demand right now. So that was kind of an unhappy note. There. <laughs> but we do hope people are inspired. Like you pick an issue and say, you know, we're calling it the journey for change. We want other people to pick issues because they're like, those two, two Chris's did this, you know? <laughs> How about me? What can I do? What can I do? Um, can I pose another question? Um, without, yeah, uh, just putting on a devil's advocate hat. Not that, not that I believe this or this is my position or anything, but it's a question I thought of. Now, until puppy mills are gone. As long as they're here, um, and you say getting a puppy from a puppy mill is, is cruelty, well, couldn't, couldn't a person argue that you're rescuing a puppy if you get a puppy from the puppy mill? Oh, that's because one of the big fights. as long as they're Absolutely. around and they're, they're sitting there in this oh, prison, um, so why others. not pick them up and, yeah. and get them out of there? These are the questions, um, you know, when, when I'm privately talking to uh, Bob Baker, <laughs> you know, there, there's the film stuff we're doing with them, and then I call Bob, and I'm like, oh my God, Bob, you know, but I'm sobbing in the phone with the animal issues, right? So the first thing was, what happens to all the animals when they get out, when, when the mills are gone? You know, that's one thing. Then there's the Amish auctions, right? <coughs> does, a, does a rescue <coughs> group raise money to go get dogs from an Amish auction? What happens to the dogs if the dogs are not sold at auction? They're killed. So you could debate that yeah, and I'm back and forth, you... and people will say, I'm not giving you money because you're supporting those creepy no, millers. You are sparking me, and you're giving me more information that you know I can discuss this issue with people, and I can see what if somebody says that to me. You know, I, there, I don't there, know exactly It is say. like Democrat and Republican. Neither one is inherently evil. It's the people perpetrating in those masks that provide whether it's for good or evil. If someone buys the dog and it goes into a great home, like Kamiko, Kamiko, they pay five bucks when they go save them out of the mills. They get squeeze an extra five bucks in lieu of death. Five bucks in lieu of death, a torturous death. Because sometimes they shoot them and they don't die right away. So they leave them. So, so is, that, is that good or bad that we paid five bucks to that miller? I would argue, as a citizen, my choice living in America was I choose to get that dog right now because there's no other protection and I want her and I want to save her life. And I've done it with lots, and that's how we got to name dog. Chris is like, oh, dog by dog, we're saving them. But then we got to make bigger change. So what we need is, we need to do, is, and Bob Baker is one who keeps me calibrated. He's like, we have to keep doing long-term change because it takes a long time to get there, while we do the best we can now with what we have. And like Chris said, you have the choice to, to buy the dog or not buy that dog. You have that choice. Now, you the lawyer, I hope you're fired up and you go, oh, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to fix that. Well, information is, is right. huge. And right. I applaud you guys. I Appreciate the I appreciate your questions because you're raising really important things, and um, and I hope you become part of the solution. Wow. Everyone in here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, we're sorry. That's it. We're right. um, <coughs> we're tired. Chris, Grimes, Chris Soul.
blogdocumentary.com. Um, thank you so much. And uh, now we have the American Veterinary Medical Association. <laughs> this Was working with that. 
So the veterinary concerns can be broken down into five major categories, those being the welfare and level of care for the breeding dogs, then the welfare and the level of care of the puppies, the quality of the offspring <coughs> that's being produced, the <coughs> sufficient or incorrect owner education um, that buyers are, are getting, and then the general lack of oversight. In the interest of time, if <laughs> we do have some, I'll also touch on some of the challenges to the development of standards and regulations from <coughs> a, a veterinary perspective. So, welfare and care of the breeding dogs. Uh, preventive care is going to be anything that we do to try to keep the animals healthy. Um, with vaccines, the rabies vaccine is the only one that's required by law and needs to be given by a veterinarian. Any dog in a breeding facility really should be getting distemper and border collar as well. I don't know how many of you are familiar with distemper and parvovirus. Those are kind of big things that puppies, um, they're highly contagious um, issues with puppies. They're really deadly. Um, we certainly want moms and, and dads to be um, to be vaccinated for that as well. Depending on where they live, there are obviously other ones that should be given, given to. Parasite control is really important. That's internal and external parasites. So fleas and ticks, that's going to be a comfort issue. Trying to transfer diseases. Um, internal parasites like heartworm disease, um, that's life-threatening, transferred by mosquitoes. And more like intestinal parasites, um, roundworms, hookworms very, very common in puppies. They usually get it from nursing with their mom. So if we can have that control and prevention in the adults, that means we're going to have healthier puppies. It's not usually life threatening in adults, although it does affect their quality of life. Um, it can be really dangerous um, in, in the young puppies. Grooming is certainly touched on often when we talk about substandard breeders and puppy mills. We see these poor guys just covered in mats. Um, it just takes general general care. Um, that matting they can't see, they'll get skin infections, um, overgrown nails will get caught on things and damaged, they'll grow into their pads and cause abscesses. Um, it's not expensive, but it does take time and that's certainly a corner that does get cut by people who aren't taking these animals into concern. Dental care goes along with that. Um, they can certainly lose teeth from trying to get out of these these cages, they're also just going to lose teeth from being older and not having anybody take care of them. Um, brushing's probably not in the cards. It's kind of challenging just to get in <laughs> for me to do it for my own dogs. Um, but we should be getting them in to see a veterinarian, get a professional dental clean under general anesthesia before we see such significant disease that we're getting gingival recession, bone loss, teeth falling out, tooth root abscesses. Uh, assuming we do all of that right, there's still going to be ongoing medical care. Dealing with a, um, a breeding female has additional costs um, and responsibilities that go along with that. Um, with pregnancy and whelping is, is having puppies. Um, dystocia means they're having trouble actually giving birth. Um, a lot of substandard breeders are aiming for things like the tiniest dog possible. So when we're breeding a three pound dog to a five pound dog, it doesn't matter how small that puppy is coming out, the mom is very tiny. They're not always going to fit. Um, same thing goes with um, English Bulldogs, Frenchies, any of those really big <laughs> headed dogs. Um, and they're not, they're not going to come out on their own, um, which means there's a C-section. So it's the responsibility of those breeders to get to a vet beforehand, get an x-ray done. We can count, see how many puppies we're expecting. If we know there's four and only three have come out and they're having trouble, that's an emergency C-section. And taking the responsibility to get them to an animal hospital and pay for that surgery in the middle of the night. Um, there's obviously a cost that goes along with that. And then mastitis is something that can happen afterwards while they're, they're nursing. Um, sometimes it's because of being in unsanitary conditions. Sometimes it's because there are a lot of puppies that are trying to nurse and, and stuff happens. But that involves um, significant infection that going to um, cause fever, um, decreased appetite. Um, the moms aren't producing enough milk then in order to support the puppies. Um, and they're uncomfortable. They're not going to want the puppies around them. So that would necessitate uh, a visit to a vet, get some antibiotics, get some pain meds, those things addressed. And then acquired disease. Every pet, anyone who owns pets knows that they have their problems that pop up every once in a while. I use the examples of ear infections or urinary tract infection because those are pretty common ones that we see. They're not going to be life-threatening. 
but it's a quality of life issue. These are really uncomfortable things, and they can be signs of greater problems. Chronic um, or recurrent urinary tract infections can mean bladder stones or potentially kidney issues, and then ear infections can be a sign of an allergy, whether it be a food allergy or a seasonal allergy that really needs some more attention. Um, age at breeding and frequency, um, they can go into heat and potentially get pregnant six to nine months is old, is pretty typical. We don't want puppies having puppies. Um, they're not physically mature, they're not behaviorally mature, they can't be, um, be good moms, they're not going to be able to uh, appropriately train their puppies to be good dogs because they haven't had that opportunity themselves. There's a greater chance of those puppies having problems um, uh, right from right from the beginning, and then frequency. Um, if we're, there's an obvious animal welfare issue with breeding these, <coughs> these dogs every time that they that they cycle. Um, housing, space. Um, we want to make sure that they have um, adequate space, so they have different areas for feeding, elimination, and then rest. Uh, those wire cage floors are completely unacceptable, causes a lot of problems with, with paws. Um, we need uh, some solid surface um, for them to be on, some place where they can retreat for security um, so they can feel safe in their environment, and especially when they are um, having, having puppies, having a welcome box. So that's just going to be a little area where they can nest, so they can have their puppies and feel, feel safe. Um, but still be in an area where people can keep an eye on them and make sure that, that things are progressing the way that they're supposed to. Behavior is definitely a concern um, with substandard breeders. Um, being in a cage by yourself all of the time um, is, is very detrimental. Um, daily socialization with both humans and other animals is going to be paramount. Um, that can be combined with exercise, going out for walks, being in a large enclosed area with other dogs to be able to play. Um, when they are by themselves, having environmental enrichment. Um, if they can't be co-housed with other animals, being in a place where they can see um, other animals, having toys uh, and, and things like that. Diet's a really easy corner to cut as far as cost savings. Um, if you're uh, having a breeding animal, they need a really high quality diet. It uh, needs to be readily available. Ideally, um, these animals are, are eating puppy food because they need those extra calories, they need that nutrients. And that's through the entire pregnancy and nursing. Um, and then one of the sadder parts of it is what happens at retirement. Um, is there some sort of a plan for them when they're no longer breeding and, and producing some sort of profit for these people? Um, are they abandoned? Are they relinquished? If they are keeping them, are they deciding to have them spayed at that point? So they don't develop a problem like the pine intra, which if um, older females are cycling and not becoming pregnant, they have a risk every cycle to get an infection inside of their uterus. And it pretty much fills up with pus and they die unless we get it out. And that's usually an emergency surgery in the middle of the night. So um, either having the forethought to have them spayed when they're no longer going to be bred or knowing that you might be responsible for, um, for that care um, for them if they do develop Ohio. And then females who are not spayed before their first couple of cycles um, have a greatly increased chance of developing mammary tumors when they're older. So taking that responsibility to, if there is a nodule, getting that biopsy, getting it removed if it is malignant, taking the appropriate steps because they are the reason why um, they want to stay as younger dogs. Welfare and care of puppies, very similar <laughs> to that of breeding dogs. Good diet, good housing, behavior is almost more important in puppies. That socialization time between birth and eight weeks is huge. If they aren't exposed to other dogs, people, novel stimuli, um, they're going to be scared for the rest of their lives. Just being able to kind of go with the flow and, uh, and be good house pets, a lot of that foundation is made during that, during that beginning time. So if they're just kept in a cage by themselves with their mom or removed um, from their mom as soon as they can meet and shipped out, um, that's going to have some major problems. Preventive care definitely starts before eight weeks, which is usually when we see them. Um, moving on to the pet stores or, or directly to, to owners, uh, but it's going to be different depending on where they're at. And uh, ideally there's going to be a veterinarian involved in developing that program, dealing with any kind of medical care with problems they might kind of come up with. 
uh, having adequate identification and record keeping. As a general practitioner, uh, seeing puppies from a lot of places, it would just say puppy number two and have stickers of what vaccines they got and dewormed on these days. It wouldn't necessarily be what kind of medications they were using, if the dog was male or female, um, defining characteristics as far as color. So there was no way for us to really show that these medical records went with this particular dog. And even if it did, it didn't have any worthwhile information on it. So if we want to have any reasonable continuation of care, there needs to be a standard for that. And um, there aren't medical record standards uh, for people who are, who are breeders. And then age at weaning and sale. Um, taking them away from their, their moms when they're four weeks old, just so they can get them out um, to save costs. It's a really big issue. A lot of states will have rules. I keep using eight weeks because that's what I see most often. Um, but I definitely saw eight week old puppies based on the birth dates that I had on their paperwork. And the owner said, oh, I got them two weeks ago. Oh, I got them a month ago. And uh, that's we're already setting them up for failure with that as far as challenging their, their little immune systems, not letting them develop behaviorally um, appropriately. And uh, these consumers, the owners, don't realize, uh, I think at the time, that they're, they're setting themselves up for, for a lot more than they ever originally expected. And transport to pet stores and, and new owners, even if you are waiting until 8, 10 weeks or putting puppies in the car on a plane shipping them in a large truck. Um, their immune systems are, are not what they, they need to be even if we have started their vaccine protocols. Just the stress of travel is going to bring up um, upper respiratory infections and diarrhea, which in a small puppy can be, can be life threatening. Mm -hmm. uh, quality of offspring. Ideally, good breeders, responsible breeders. We are aiming for a good disposition and confirmation and trying to decrease of the incidence of congenital diseases. There are some breeds that are going to have some problems, and that's things that we did to ourselves hundreds of years ago when we developed these breeds. Um, but the effort now is to try to breed out these problems. Um, when we're dealing with substandard breeders, we're more concerned about aesthetics. We want to make the smallest dog possible. We want these colors that are uncommon. We want more wrinkles in our English bulldog. So because of that, uh, we're using inappropriate parents. Sometimes it's going to be a cousin or a brother that might have that, that idea, I ideal characteristic. So they're just going to breed those together because those puppies are going to look better. But internally, we're going to have some major problems. Um, same goes for animals with known hereditary diseases. Um, hip dysplasia is a big one. Um, uh, being cryptorchid, that's when vulnerable testicles don't drop. If it's happened in dad, it's probably going to happen moving on. Those are much more likely to become cancerous and cause problems, um, but they still work. <laughs> so you can still breed these dogs, and they should never be bred. Um, but if they also happen to have a particular color or these amazing wrinkles or spots, um, people will use them. They use them anyway. Uh, we've spoken a lot about education. I, I'm really happy that that's come up in, in other presentations. Uh, Getting to the owners and the consumers beforehand, I think is going to stop a lot of our problems. Um, but something that veterinarians deal with on the ground after these puppies are purchased is a lot of incorrect or insufficient information. Uh, people come in with a puppy and say, they promised me it would only be five pounds. Well, there's no way that your four and a half pound tiny old dog is not going to be five pounds. It's, it's, <laughs> that's the deal. Um, Labradoodles are not hypoallergenic. Sometimes there's more lab than there is poodle, and some poodles aren't hypoallergenic. Um, I've had people come in with black labs, and they're like, they told me it would be a wonderful apartment dog for my family. They're like, who would tell you that? <laughs> what are you going to do with 90 pounds of bouncing? Um, and, but now the whole family's fallen in love with this cute little, this cute little puppy. Um, and things like diet. Um, there are some breeders who really believe in grain-free or homemade foods, and those can be done well, but they're not necessary. Um, there's very few dogs that have sensitivities to grain. Most of the time with feed allergies is actually going to be a protein. It's piggybacked on the whole gluten-free human um, diets. Um, and homemade is almost impossible. I know I can't feed myself appropriately without taking vitamins. There's no way I would be able to cook for a dog and make sure that they got everything that they needed. 
Um, and insufficient information would be just what is involved with taking care of a puppy. So you've dropped hundreds or thousands of dollars on this purebred mix designer puppy and you think that you're done. If you were told he's, he's up to date on vaccines and deworming, you're good. Well, your puppy is 10 weeks old. That care goes at least until 16 to 17 weeks, just as far as getting finished with the boosters. And then it's a lifetime thing. And in addition to veterinary care, training and socialization, just the time commitment of house training a dog, whether it takes three months or a year, um, that's a problem. And breed specific diseases. If you get yourself a golden retriever, it's probably going to get cancer someday. And that's an issue that we deal with the breed. If you have a dachshund and it throws out its back, Doxins do that, um, and some people aren't prepared for the fact that they might have to make some really hard decisions later in life um, just because they went with those specific things. My biggest issue with the owner education is we're setting up unrealistic expectations, and that's going to affect the human animal bond. So, we've got this puppy at home, people want to keep them and want them to be as part of their family, but when there are financial commitments, time commitments, um, unrealistic expectations about what the animal is going to look like or behave like that just aren't being met, um, that's going to lead to, to relinquishment, abandonment, or a lack of care because that relationship is just going to be, um, is going to be challenged. <coughs> Veterinary oversight, I sort of did this one last um, because it goes over everything else that we talked about beforehand. We want to be able to see these puppies. We want to be able to see these breeding females. We want to be able to see um, where they're coming from and try to get prevention in place, making sure that the, um, the animals are being monitored daily, not by a vet, but by someone who's working in these facilities so they can identify problems and, and get them addressed. Uh, figuring out some sort of a vaccine protocol, the parasite prevention, that kind of thing, and making sure that the health records are something that we can actually work with, um, work with later on. Pretty good? Yeah. All right. So, um, <laughs> real quick, uh, these are things from on the ground that I see as a veterinarian as being challenges to making standards and regulations. One of the biggest ones is going to be the different sizes in the program. So, when you hear about puppy mills, we think about these huge facilities with these lines of cages and dogs that aren't taken care of. I've seen a lot of animals from what I would call backyard breeders, where they have two breeding pairs, um, but they're not kept in the house. Um, they're in the same or worse conditions that we would see in these larger scale uh, facilities. The only purpose for them is to make money and breed as soon as possible, as much as possible, and they come in with absolutely terrible conditions. Um, so it definitely goes goes both ways. So trying to find one way to regulate everybody is, is definitely a challenge. Um, but it's something we definitely need to consider that it's not just, the, the, the big ones might make a larger impact, but um, there are also these poor individuals in these smaller areas. Um, and sometimes it's just people you know, um, and thinking that that's okay. Um, as far as more like the lemon laws, uh, as far as owners having some sort of recourse um, after getting a kind of a substandard puppy, um, some of these congenital and hereditary diseases don't show up for a really long time. It could be years before um, we, we find stuff out. Um, even if it's something that they're born with, they might not show clinical signs. So they'll be able to compensate for a while before they actually show signs of illness. It's not typical for us to do blood work on a puppy at least until they're spayed or neutered. So we'll say that's maybe five to six months old. Um, that's way past the 48 hour to two week time period that most pet stores are gonna allow you to go to a vet, get them checked out and say, oh, they've got a congenital disease. And some of them are gonna be things like heart problems. You have a murmur or, uh, or a shunt in the liver. You can't see that on a physical exam necessarily. Um, you need an echocardiogram, which you're gonna have to go to a cardiologist for. And these are all things that the owner is going to have to put the bill for up front. And if you have a puppy that looks healthy and isn't causing problems, are you going to be recommending doing all of these tests as a screening that is going to be thousands of dollars if you did everything um, just to make sure? And then if the recompense is the 
worth of the puppy, so you spent $500 on this puppy, and you just spent $1,500 on diagnostics and management of whatever issue came up, it's not really, really weighing out. And a lot of the paperwork that I saw from, um, from specifically pet stores was you're going to have the, kind of the, a refund as far as the puppy goes, or we'll replace your puppy for you. <laughs> and I don't know a lot of people who after two weeks, two months, two years are going to be like, oh yeah, I'll just trade it in. That's not, it's, that's not realistic. Um, and then when do, we, when do we deal with owners as far as responsibility for educating themselves beforehand on, on what they're getting themselves into? Um, my last slide is about my and this is Roland. So uh, Roland was uh, adopted as a rescue. As far as I know, he's a purebred boxer. I never got him genetically tested. Um, he was super, super skinny when we got him. We no idea. We found him on the streets. We don't know what his history was, um, other than breaking with a horrendous upper respiratory infection within the first week. He otherwise looked good. I put way too much weight on him initially, and I had to pull a little bit off. Um, <laughs> and and he was good um, from about when he was a year old when we got him until he was about four. And at that point, he got every boxer disease in the book. <laughs> so he started fainting. It's called syncope. It has to do with his heart. Um, there's something called boxer cardiomyopathy, where they get an arrhythmia, and their brain doesn't get enough um, blood, and they pass out. So what he's wearing right now is um, called a Holter harness. It is a mobile ECG monitor that he wears for like 48 hours, and then we send it off to the cardiologist. So that was when we were trying to figure out what was going on initially. Um, mast cell tumors are a malignant um, skin tumor that I found a, about a year ago. Um, got that thing taken off. Luckily, it was low grade, but we're going to be keeping an eye on that for the rest of his life. And he has an oncologist in his future. Um, he's a little bit of a bald patch on his butt. I don't know if you can appreciate that. He's got some gnarly skin allergies, so he's on a prescription grade dog food. <laughs> and um, I'm starting to try to brush his teeth more because boxers look at this ginger bowl hyperplasia where their gums will overgrow and start kind of biting their teeth. Um, none of this showed up until he was four years old. So if I had gotten him from a breeder, um, if I had gotten him from a pet store, um, at what point can you go back and say, my, my dog has all these problems? And these are boxer problems. I had a discussion with my husband before we took him home from the shelter that, all these things might happen to our dog. And he said, not a problem. And all of them did. <laughs> and he is a cardiologist, so we're, we're on board. But I'm a veterinarian. I knew about this beforehand. Um, this was part of my education. Um, this You can Google boxer problems and come up with all of these things. But I don't think a lot of owners do. Um, so there has to be a balance, I think, between owners taking responsibility for what kind of animals they're bringing into their homes and knowing what they're getting themselves into. Um, and Getting that information from, from a, a reputable breeder is going to prepare you for some of these things. Ideally, you're not going to be dealing with this, but what we don't want are um, people giving dogs and saying, well, you have a health guarantee, everything's going to be fine. Well, dogs get sick, problems happen, most people get lucky, um, but you still need to be aware of the fact that um, sometimes you get a woman. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm going to pass things off to Adrian, um, he is the, the more law expert here, and then we'll take questions at the end. Association. I went to a couple of healthcare associations 
And here I am working with the most wonderful members. Um, one can imagine that they're so wonderful people. But um, and I want to give you a little bit of an overview, a regular overview. Chris um, actually went over some of the points I was going to make. And um, thank you for that. Um, this is not a good issue. Well, first of all, I have to introduce you to, uh, this is my board of directors when I go home. <laughs> and I have to report on what's going on. Um, one uh, is a stray animal that's sort of like walked into our house. And one is a, um, a rescue from, um, from home away. You can figure out which one is which, I think. All right, so uh, there are some regulations that um, <coughs> do apply, and I think by and large we're talking about commercial careers, when we talk about coffee mills, I think that's really what we're talking about. Um, and one of the things that really struck me, we're talking about pet store closings, you know, that's not going to shut down the coffee mills in my view, because we're talking about breeders. And um, I think a lot of the sales that the breeders um, get are from you know, direct sales, and the internet now, of course. But I mean, I have, a, I have neighbors, and I, I know a lot of people who, they'll drive to Rockford or Wisconsin, to buy the, you know, that, that puppy that they want. Uh, so I don't think the pet store bans are necessarily going to put these bad players out of business. Uh, we do have some regulations, and like Chris said, part of it is owner education and, and this voter education as far as the issue. Um, and, you know, not to, not to, um, not to be customers, uh, you know, if, if a pet store um, has a bad reputation, you know, uh, that should affect their sales. There should, should be a supply and demand, um, you know, penalty, so to speak. But we do have regulations, and I think um, that is another uh, tool in, in putting these bad players out of business. The Animal Welfare Act at the federal level has been with us for a long time. 1966, I included the, um, the citation. Uh, it requires some basic standards of care. Um, applies not only to breeders, but um, also to transporting uh, animals mm -hmm. and exhibitors. Um, it, was, it was mentioned earlier. Uh, it does require licensure for people who breed and sell dogs and cats for use as pets, and, um, and dealers uh, who supply the dogs and cats to the pet, pet stores. Very important exemptions, however, uh, if you look at that second or bullet point, household pets sold directly at retail. And it was changed to, to be physical, physical presence. So internet sales are not now covered, which was a, a, a major loophole uh, that the Animal Welfare Act needed um, some regulatory explanation. Hobby breeders, some of the small <coughs> breeders that uh, Dr. Bullahan talked about, um, if you don't own more than three breeding females, um, you're exempt from the federal law. So, um, as a result, we've seen a lot more state activity over the years, which I'll, I'll get to in, in, in a second. The Federal Animal Welfare Act includes standards of um, you know, adequate care, treatment, sanitation, nutrition, uh, veterinary care, um, a number of uh, items that are required. And they do inspect. I know we've heard that the regulatory system enforcement um, is not up to par. Um, I actually went on the website of USDA and I have some statistics for you. It appears that most of the uh, breeders and kennels are inspected about once a year. If there are complaints, if there are um, uh, inspections show problem areas, they will be inspected as often as uh, every three months. Um, those without problems, every two to three years. And the latest year I could find is 2010. And you can look at the numbers. Uh, these are just the breeders. 32, uh, 3,296 licensed breeding facilities. Uh, and it has roughly 3,500 compliance inspections, 544 pre-licensed. So I mean, there are inspections. Um, we want to see more funding and, you know, a little bit more um, enforcement, absolutely. But then, I just wanted to have these numbers up because you hear a lot of different things, and, and these are. Uh, so, with all, with all those inspections, how many violations have there been? Um, the website does include that. I, I think there are, there are a few, but obviously. Okay, but you're saying that there were 16,699 inspections, and you're saying there were a few violations? I don't have that number for it. Um, I mean, but doesn't that cause you concern? Well, um, it, it, I'd like to see a vigorous inspection process. 
Um, what I'd like to see is, um, you know, regulators actually be able to, to tell us. I would love to see somebody from the Illinois Department of Ag or USDA, because I personally don't have, you know, that type of um, knowledge. This is one of many issues that we're, we're looking at. Um, so it's only five people for the Illinois Department of Ag that's like 102 counties. So, I mean, just, just that's pretty difficult for them just even yeah. to come and do the inspections. I agree with you. I, I, I think that needs to be beefed up. I have the numbers for Illinois um, Department of Ag coming up, too. Because I was curious, like, you know, um, I suspected Illinois, given the, the state of the state finances, is, is probably not inspecting as often as it should. And the numbers are not quite as high as USDA. But they're actually higher than I thought. Uh, to fill in the gap, and I think Chris mentioned this too, states have begun to uh, regulate commercial breeders and, and pet stores to some degree. Uh, you know, our county's 38 states in D.C. Um, have adopted some sort of regulation. And most of these laws have been adopted in the last 10 years. There's been a lot of activity. I think HSUS was behind a lot of those. Um, and these regulations, as you can imagine, 38 states, they vary greatly um, on a number of, of issues. Uh, just to give you a sampling, in 2014, Minnesota and Connecticut are the ones to adopt statewide regulations. Um, and in these uh, in this regulatory environment, we've seen a lot of bills that we thought you know, the, um, they could be written a little bit better. And so the AVMA uh, put together a task force and ultimately the executive board approved a model bill um, which applies to high volume breeders and retailers and pet stores. Um, and it's available at the AVMA website. I have the um, URL there. Um, it has a number of items uh, to ensure that the dogs sold or distributed to the public um, are protected. And it doesn't really get into the facility type, it's just one standard. It's a dog welfare standard applicable to um, all facilities, whether shelters or, or uh, kennels. The pet store bans. Yes, question. So with the um, uh, model law that you were just mentioning, is there any, just what would the enforcement mechanism for that be? Because as we've just discussed, the USDA that already, um, <coughs> You know, somebody could, could say that enforcement is quite lax and has a lot of deficiencies. So if you're talking about uh, increasing those standards and there's even more to monitor, more to enforce, uh, has the AVMA thought about what that mechanism would be, how, that, how, how you would implement that? The model bill is a piece of legislation that could be adopted by the state. Mm -hmm. That's really the part of it. There's an enforcement uh, paragraph and there's a funding paragraph. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, whether it gets funded, of course, you know, that's out of our hands. Okay. But, uh, but we do, we are aware that, you know, enforcement is a huge issue. Okay. Thanks. The pet store bans, you've heard about Cook County, uh, is a subject to a court challenge. Um, Los Angeles, San Diego, Phoenix, Chicago, and a number of other local governments have adopted um, bans on commercially bred animals in pet stores. Um, you know, we'll see how the legal challenges are going to come out. We've heard a lot about this already today. Um, I want to note that one statewide bill that uh, targets pet stores was enacted in Connecticut this year. And while the Illinois bill did not pass, Connecticut uh, did after a task force worked uh, for several months with all stakeholders um, at the table. And it's an interesting approach, and it, it may actually end up as a compromise you're going to see in, uh, in more states that would allow the sale of dogs and cats obtained from USDA uh, licensed breeders as long as they don't have direct violations um, for a two-year period. So my prediction is you're probably going to see a few more states look at that. Uh, the main criticism, of course, is if the USDA is not really inspecting or enforcing properly, how can you trust the system? You know, but um, it is some assurance that uh, these, uh, you know, the breeders have been inspected. Yes. Again, how would you enforce that? Well, almost, you know, any piece of legislation we're going to talk about enforcement is an issue. How do you enforce a ban on pet stores? How do you know that the, you know, dog didn't come from a breeder? Um, you know. I think that's probably a little easier. I guess my question is, you would, you would have to have somebody go in 
to the pet stores in Connecticut and do almost cross-reference where the dog came from. If, I mean, we all know that that's not going to work. I mean, who's going to be who's going to be responsible for that? In, in, in Connecticut, they must have something in mind because they passed it. And and the Illinois um, bill that actually never went up for a vote. So that's kind of a moot point. But I just I'm always interested in how when somebody submits a bill like that, proposes a bill like that, where the enforcement fits into because that seems to be the major theme through all of this. So how difficult it is to enforce if someone has to look at what's a direct violation versus an indirect violation. And then if it was within the last three years, somebody has to go back to think we just, the more kind of specifics you put in terms of what is an acceptable or permissible source, the more difficult it is to enforce. And well, we'll see how the Connecticut approach works out. You know, we should have some data. Um, and, and, and I mean, there was a compromise in that there was a task force that really had some contentious uh, hearings because the, the original bill was very much like the county ordinance, you know, to ban commercially bred uh, dogs from pet stores. And, uh, you know, it was a political compromise in the store. So it would be very interesting to talk to the folks in Connecticut and see how it is enforced. You know, I'm, I'm sure the Department of Agriculture probably is the, the agency that so we'll, we'll watch for that. I think that law went into effect October 1st. The beginning of the month. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, pet purchase protection laws, also known as lemon laws. Um, 21 states provide legal recourse for people who purchase um, animals, usually uh, from a pet store, uh, later found to have a disease or defect. Um, there's common remedies involved in replacement of the animal, a refund. Um, for reimbursement of veterinary expenses up to a certain um, price, usually it's the, the purchase price of the animal. Um, I would venture to guess that even in the non-21 states, um, the consumer, through the state consumer protection um, law, may have uh, some remedies as well. And we do have a list of these state laws um, on our website as well. What's the AVMA's position with regard to some of those remedies? Like well, placement. we have a background. We have a background there um, on the website. We do not have a, a, a position on the uh, pet purchase protection laws. You know, the, the pet task forces look at this, uh, committees and... So with regard to this replacement, the AVMA doesn't have a position on that? As far as replacement? For the animal as a remedy? Well, it's something that... Uh, you know, if the state law, you know, allows it, you know, it's fine. I and mean, we're not a direct player in, um, in, the, in the, you know, in, in how these pet money laws are going to look. Um, I think it's pretty typical, you know, that the remedies include... Uh, but you represent that. vets. I mean, the vets don't, don't think that that's an inappropriate remedy? I think that the biggest issue that we are having at this point is we can't find a good remedy at this point. So we're kind of looking at... Uh, Wouldn't veterinary care be a good remedy? Yeah, but then kind of like the, the point that I brought up. So, like Roland, he, the issues that I had with him were four years out in, in his life. And um, if I was not doing a lot of those things by myself, <laughs> we would be in the thousands of dollars as far as care. Um, at least one of his issues, two of his issues are chronic, which means he's needed to be on this very expensive food and go back and see a cardiologist every year. Um, at what point does that stop? Um, can you go after a breeder or a, uh, a, a pet store for the X number of tens of, tens of thousands of dollars that might be needed in order to care for him over the course of his entire life. Another thing would be him having a cardiologist is not a mandated standard of care. I'm doing that because I want to do that. Um, if I had a client that came in with a painting boxer and they were like, I don't have money to get an echocardiogram and do yearly chest x-rays and have him seen by a specialist, there is nothing saying that they have to do that. So. Um, these people who would potentially have to provide that money and those remedies could use that as an argument. Where if we're going to hold them up to those standards, we would also need to hold 
individual owners up to those those same standards as far as caring for their their animals over the, the course of, of their lives. So I know that doesn't directly address um, but that, that would, that would your go question, actual but, damages. Though. Yeah, but those are the problems. Is those those damages can go on forever. And the right, but it's just like, it's just like with in, 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 in tort law, I mean, if you cause a car accident, if I cause a car accident and somebody's injured, the fact that they may suffer things into the future is part of the harm I'm causing. Yeah, but, it's, uh, that, but that would be the, the challenge. When does it stop? And when, what is the level of care? Like, I guess human medicine might be a little bit more consistent in that, where veterinary care can flux as far as medical management versus surgery. Thing, things like that, and at the end of the day, pets are still um, property under the law, um, and that's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> but until that changes, um, uh, replacement of the dog or money up until what they are worth um, is pretty much what we're I, at. I think I, I think I understand your question, but I don't know. If you're talking about um, remedies as far as liability, you know, as far as the lawsuit, um, economic damages, we do have a policy that includes veterinary care. For the animal that is harmed, that would be included in um, what should be recoverable. So I think that's what you're going with this question, right? Well, no, I was actually talking about with regard to the, the lemon laws and the, the purchase, whether whether the AVMA thinks that a replacement would be acceptable, because nobody that I know thinks that that makes any sense. Oh, like exchanging your dog, like here's a better puppy? Yeah. Yeah. Includes replacement of the animal. <laughs> common remedies. Well, that's a common, common remedies. It's not AVMA. Advocates for it. That's what, but that's uh, what I think it would be very unusual. Uh, very few people would choose that. Yeah. I, I think that you know, that's once, something. Once that you have a tie with the animal, yeah. you're going to want to. I think we're going to have to cut short our discussion yeah. because we have an entire additional panel to get through, and I don't want to put as much past 630. So you, okay. have, you have a couple of. Thank you very much. I just want to mention one of the slides um, that is not even material. These are the numbers I just got Monday from the Illinois Department of Ag. I was curious about it. How many inspections do they do? Um, and so these are the numbers. Um, you know, I'd love to have a follow-up program with the regulators to really explain how they do it and what they do, because I just don't have personal knowledge. But we do have a mechanism in Illinois, you know, that we can work on. Thank you very much.
I just yeah. He said you can't get around for you. Yeah, when they release it all, let it go. So, like, I mean, like, we haven't got the other ones, but so, like, you don't even need to, like, to, like, go back. Those you don't have a chance. Well, but, but we're about ready to get started, so. Silly, so. I just want to know I do a class of six, and probably going to be found out. Yeah, I'll be fine. I will. Okay, okay. Okay. Starting this group in 2009, she has become a national leader in bringing awareness to the plight of animals and puppy mills. This organization conducts peaceful protests, walks, and demonstrations to raise awareness of the puppies um, that the puppies sold in the pet stores do in fact come from puppy mills. She also works with officials at all levels of government to improve the conditions for dogs living in puppy mills and with rescue groups to find homes for puppy mills dogs. Um, let's begin with Julia Ellis. So uh, I guess you guys have gotten a little bit of context <laughs> here <laughs> on what has sort of happened recently in Chicago, in the Chicago land area, um, primarily that we have recently as a city and, and now at the county level um, made a sort of broad sweeping policy statement 
that we are going to address the, the problem of puppy milk dogs and all the things that are associated with them by limiting, uh, in the case of the city of Chicago simply, uh, not allowing retailers to sell dogs that are coming from commercial facilities. So they, the, the gist of the Chicago ordinance, and I'll let Sherry get into how the, the county works, um, but the gist of the Chicago ordinance that we passed in March of 2014 basically says that if you're a retail pet store, um, you cannot sell dogs that don't come from either a humane society, um, a shelter, or a government agency uh, that that is in the business of animal care and welfare. So like the city of Chicago has animal care and control, and animal care and control could give their dogs to um, a pet store and allow the pet store to sell, uh, to sell them. So having said that, sort of laying the framework, I think that I'll take a slightly different bend on this. Um, Mostly because the, the, the number one question that I get asked when I'm talking with people in this arena is, is how does it happen, right? It's sort of opaque. Okay, how do you, as a group of people who would be interested in animal welfare and laws surrounding animal welfare, how do you approach government, talk to government, and actually get something passed? So I'm going to try to help tell that story because um, you know, I think it's useful, and it's. I am an attorney, but it is a very different venue. I also have an alternative legal group. Um, so let me start by saying that I uh, just given a little background here. I work for the city clerk. Um, the city clerk is one of three citywide elected officials. There's the mayor, the treasurer, and the city clerk. Uh, in, and her history here is that she was a, a state representative for 14 years before she went and became uh, ran for clerk. And while she was a state representative, actually it's where I met her, I was on the staff for the General Assembly, she ran a couple of legislative items having to do with animal welfare. Um, it, it really started, she had an interest in crime and discovered that there was a connection between animal abuse and uh, and child abuse, and that sort of <coughs> launched her into this interest area. She also sponsored some of the, the regulations that are, have been discussed here today, namely the um, Disclosure Act. And that was a, it was a heavy lift, we like to say, in the, the legislative world. Um, it's, it, you know, this, the stories of it, they predate my time in the legislature, but um, there's, there are a lot of concerns around this industry and regulation in this industry that go beyond the, um, the immediate problem of puppies and get into, okay, agriculture in general, how do we treat cows, how do we, and if we sort of take this step as, as legislators towards protecting puppies, does it mean that we're suddenly going to be in the, uh, the arena of telling people how to treat their chickens, right? So there is, there's a lot of concern for this issue that goes beyond what we're talking about today or what most people would associate with our companion animals. So, having said that, I would uh, say that if, you know, as, a, as private citizens who are interested in working with government and trying to get something like this done, um, the Puppy Mill Project really did it right. So Carrie here is. <laughs> um, the, the legislative world is, is sort of a blend of, of appealing to the public and sort of making your case in a public sphere and also anticipating what will come next, which is every time you pass a law, someone will sue you at the end of it. It's just the natural course of things. Um, so what the Puppy Mill Project did really well is they, they got together, I don't know if you guys have seen this ordinance, I've got um, an example of it, I don't think I copied it right here. So this thing is seven, five pages long, it ended at five pages long. And the first portion of it is really all of the statistics that support <coughs> why this needed to happen. And so there's all sorts of reasons that um, this that the existing 
problem impacts the city <coughs> from a consumer's perspective, right? And that is health and welfare. That's something that we as, uh, as a city have a vested interest in protecting our citizens' health and welfare. Um, it talks about the, the, fini the financial impact on the city. So this is legwork that these guys did well in advance of coming and talking to us, but it was very, very important legwork. Um, it just talked, they had really done, they'd done their homework in getting to animal care and control and, and sort of synthesizing the data and presenting a really cohesive argument about how much this costs um, so that, you know, depending on whether or not you wanted to attach yourself to this issue from the, all right, here's the impact on the families that take home a, a dog that has some of these health problems, or you want to take home, um, uh, you want to look at it from the city's view of how much are we spending to get animals, bring them into animal care and control, um, to euthanize them in 30 to 45 percent of cases, and, or, of course, there's always the heart strings component of just listening to what the animals themselves have in many times uh, gone through before they've gotten to a pet store. So, I, you know, uh, would they, these guys uh, are owed a round of applause for that one because they did a, a fantastic job. So just to give you some of the statistics that were really compelling to us when we were approached with this issue, um, 20,000 animals come into animal care and control every year, and I'll let <coughs> Sherry probably knows more about this than anyone. Um, six to 9,000 of them are euthanized, and it costs the city about $300,000 a year just to euthanize the animals that are there. So that's the raw data, and then you get into the stories of how our existing regulatory structure is just failing. Um, the, as I said, my, my boss, the clerk, had worked to establish disclosure requirements and what we had discovered or what we were, we were hearing from the Puppy Mill Project and candidly everyone. I've never worked on an issue before that had such widespread public support. I mean, people will pull me out of a line at Jewel and say, thank you. Uh, that never happens. No one ever says thank you to anyone in government. So it's For those who say no. <laughs> never. It's never happened. Um, but um, we were finding that it was nearly impossible for the average person to understand where their dog had come from and what the implications of that could be for their family and for their pocketbook. And so when we, we look at, all right, why did the city of Chicago choose a, a ban, right? Why not more disclosure? Why not um, tap into, try to, to lobby for more funding from the USDA, uh, for the USDA? Why not lobby for more funding for the, the Illinois Department of Ag? And what we just really discovered is that the, the more and more, the, the layers, as you added layers, it just confused the public increasing <laughs> increasingly and actually diluted um, the value of doing anything legislatively. So that's where we went to the pit. And of course, one of the things that you're going to hear in here over and over again <coughs> is of course when you look at this as a government entity and you consider, all right, I want to regulate this entity this this industry, you have to take the next step and say, all right, how much is it going to cost me to do that? Can I really live up to that? Because nothing really, nothing irritates people as much as passing a law and then not being able to enforce it. Because you know the public expects that their elected officials, that the people that they pay with their tax dollars, are are out there making sure that the the policy objectives are being met. And if you can't enforce something, it doesn't work. So those were those were the uh, those were some very compelling reasons for us to take the approach that we did, which was this ban. And so from here, I'll sort of step back and again get you into the all right. How as a group of people who are interested in in uh, animal welfare and policy, how do you approach a government? Well, the first thing that you do that's really important is you pick a sponsor. So in this case, um, the advocates had approached different people, and, and some of those people had said, ah, maybe not now, um, but pointed them to us. And this was an issue where 
we had worked, we had been in this arena, uh, my boss knew something about it, she cared about it. So that's really going to be, that's really important because your sponsor is going to be the person that's out there fighting that battle for you every single day. So the first step is to, is to get this thing drafted, get it introduced to council, um, and then you start your, your work with individual legislators. So it, the way it works in the city, and every, every legislative entity is different, but something is introduced to council within about two or three weeks, so there's really tight timelines, that measure will be referred to a committee, heard in a committee. The committee is where the heavy lifting is done. Um, and again, you know, every, every entity is different. In the General Assembly, there's a lot of floor debate, and the, the, you know, regardless of whether or not you're in a particular committee with this particular subject matter, all sorts of people will get involved and get, you know, and they'll peel off and have votes. But at the city, it's really at the, co the committee level that everything happens, that the substance of this is um, debated. And there were, <coughs> there are, so there's, an, there's balancing of interests here, right? So naturally, we're concerned about our businesses. In the city of Chicago, we want to make sure that we have a thriving economy. Um, so a lot of the questions when this went to committee were, how will it impact businesses? Is there an alternative model? Um, here again, we had, we had found evidence from other jurisdictions that there were workable models, that this idea of adoption and selling a dog um, that, had, that was coming from a rescue that worked, and that there were other products that people could sell that allowed them to continue to be in the business, leashes, pet food, whatever. Um, we were able to, uh, we talked through some of the, uh, the economic concerns of the city and the enforcement concerns of the city. Um, we did consider alternative forms of this legislation. We worked through, I'd say, 30 or 40 different <laughs> drafts by the end of it, uh, working with our committee chairperson and different li uh, liaisons from animal care and control from our office, um, from uh, the various humane societies, talking to the American Veterinary Association, all of those, all of that feedback went into 30 or 40 drafts and what we ended up with is that simple is good. We really, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we pushed forward with it and there is, uh, if you're ever interested, there is a packet of all of the witnesses that we were able to bring in that talked to, to testify to uh, the, the impact on dogs, the impact on consumers, all of these things that we've talked about here, and some very help, heartfelt stories of families and what this does to them. And that's compelling to legislators. You know, as lawyers, we tend to zero in on facts and, and pure logic, um, but in the world of, in the legislative world, it's a mix of law and, and PR. And, and these are people who are paid to feel. They are paid to represent the human component. So I think that was probably the most compelling portion of it, was talking to people like Carrie and having her come in and present, and I'll leave that to her. So, uh, you know, after it was, there were some tense moments. This was a huge piece of legislation. Um, we had seen it happen in some very liberal jurisdictions, and so there were some questions about all right, would, would Chicago adopt it? Are we ready uh, for it? Yeah, are we ready for it? And that's a question. That is a, that's a question that we ponder all the time. But um, at the end of the day, we found overwhelming support. It came out of a committee with a unanimous vote, went to the floor, passed 49 to 1. Um, that's about as, as clear of a statement as we can get from the city council. And now, um, you know, and, and, and it was at this point that we looked around and said, all right, what can, you know, what else can we possibly do? And, and that's where we, the county stepped in and passed something that was very similar. So that is, that's sort of the background. That's the history of how it happened. Um, happy to answer any questions. All right, I'm happy to pass it to Karen Myers. <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. Please. Yeah. Um, you know what? Um, I because I wasn't here this morning uh, earlier today. I, I don't know <coughs> what has been said or what statistics were thrown at you or what you know about the mills after this whole day. Um, 
I can, I was asked to give you a little bit of background about how we started. And really, the corny story is, I'm an, a, an animal lover, particularly dogs, all my life. I've always been on, uh, associated with rescues. I was on the board of a no-kill rescue in Chicago. Started reading about puppy mills for what, I have no idea why. And came across um, uh, a website called Prisoners of Breed and started reading this every night while other people are in bed reading their novels. I'm reading about puppy mills. So I'm having a terrible time reconciling the fact that there is this enormous evil going on and this huge large-scale cruelty and it's legal. I, can't, I just can't reconcile that whole thing. And I, I thought about it and I thought about it and I realized nobody knew about puppy mills. Nobody was talking about puppy mills. The word, everybody's rescue, 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 rescue. But square one is a puppy mill. And nobody was talking about that. And I remember the day of going to a board meeting at, uh, of, of this rescue that I was on and sitting there and um, listening to everything and looking around at 50 something people and thinking not one person in this room that works in rescue I guarantee you knows what I'm talking about and I walked out of there and I said I, I got to do this I, I what for whatever's propelling me uh, that's five years ago um, we're, we're, five years. we're five year old me uh, September 10th <laughs> it was uh, to be exact what time uh, yeah it was, I don't know it was not three ten. Eleven. it might have been 12 um, but that's really the way it started. It started from the heart. I, I, I'm always going from the heart. It's, it's always, um, it's a hard business. It's a happy business when you have a small victory or a large victory. It's incredible. Um, when I started this thing, I had a wish list. I still have a wish list. I'm not going to tell you everything that's on there, but so far we're doing pretty good. We keep checking things off. And um, we have other things to attend to, which I will tell you a little bit about what's on our scope. Um, so, I mean, basically, I had some foolish people that got on board with me and really believed what I was saying and are on my board and um, support me and my, my craziness here, but um, we all made it happen. The love of the city, boy, that was uh, a, an amazing experience for us, working with Julia, working with Susanna, was uh, working, working, working. We had thought about this for two years. Two years. We were working it alone for six months. We pulled out all the other ordinances that were coming up across the country. Albuquerque, first place that ever did this, 2006. We pulled out, and we had to find something that was really going to work for Chicago. And our legal eagles worked crazy on this thing. And then, whoop, magic. We we got to Susanna's office, and really they just propel this thing into action and uh, I've got to say one of the happiest days of my life. So, great. And of course now with the county um, ordinance um, kind of on hold at the moment, I have every confidence in the world that's going to work out. It's a great ordinance. It's, it's, a, it's even a more liberal ordinance in the city of Chicago. It, it is a great ordinance. And for people who don't understand it, Part of the, 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 the ordinance is that the stores can still purchase from breeders. I, and I want to just go on record as saying I refer to the puppy millers breeders, as millers because there's a lot of confusion out there between breeders or private responsible breeders who breed for the love of the dog and millers. So that's just my own thing to stop the confusion in the world when everybody said, what about the breeders? It's not about the breeders, it's about the millers who mill. Miller's Mill, and they are milling puppies, Wikipedia. So um, this ordinance will allow for these stores, if they still want to purchase dogs, to purchase from breeders who have uh, uh, five or less breeding females. Now, these, these particular breeders don't have USDA licenses. And, and here's where everybody thinks there's the hook. If you don't have a USDA license, you can't sell to a pet store. But the USDA will authorize, according to the Animal Welfare Act, licenses for these particular breeders that do want to do business with the stores. So there you have it. They can still buy puppies. It's, it's, it's just to clear that up because there's a lot of confusion out there about that. So it's a great ordinance. I, I mean, I think it's fantastic. We will see what happens with that. And all eyes are on Chicago. Everybody is watching Chicago. This is this is the big this is the big prize. We're the kind of the big kahuna right now. 
There's um, right now 67 municipalities across the country that have passed some sort of an ordinance. Winds of change are there. This is a grassroots movement, which is what I wanted when we started. We are not connected to any of the big guys. We've done this as sort of David and Goliath, the little guy out there making his way. Um, and it is, it's, it's a grassroots movement that's happening because of legislators that are reluctant, are reluctant to pass laws. The millers are unwilling to stop the cruelty. And the agricultural lobbyists, they're, they're, they're unwilling to stop this abuse. It's just not going to stop. There's no other way to put it. So you've already heard that the USDA is the overseer of all this, and APHIS is the arm of the USDA that oversees everything. All our companion animals that are now regarded as agriculture. I don't know how that happened, but they are. My feeling, my personal feeling, and I, and I think all of us probably in this room feel that a dog, a cat that sleeps in your bed, that kisses your kids in the mouth, that is one of your family members, is not agriculture. And truly, that the only way that this is ever going to stop, all roads lead to the USDA. It's going to have to be a different division, a companion animal division. In, in the day that the USDA it doesn't have control over this, I think that's going to bode well for the animals. They came out in May of 2010 with a scathing report about how they're doing or not doing their job. I don't see much that has changed since then. If you've got at any time two to 3,000, let's say, licensed, USDA licensed mills, and you've got, uh, what, the last count was 115 or anyone, uh, 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 inspectors across the country inspecting, and they don't in just inspect the puppy mills, they're inspecting everything that the USDA has control over. Do the math. All those guys, they're not being inspected. If they get inspected, how long do you think it's going to take till that inspector goes back to see if they if they fixed the barn, if they've done this, if they've done that. It's not it's not possible. It can't happen. It's not happening. Nobody's minding the store. The only way is is to either have, you know, ten times the inspectors that we have, which is not going to happen, or to take control away from the USDA. These are not agricultural animals. When this started after the war because the crops were crummy and the USDA came in and said, grow puppies. Okay, they did, and they're growing, growing, growing. Sure. Could you explain a little bit about kind of your ideal vision? Um, you know, if we move forward and there were no puppy mills, or you know, they were better with better oversight or something like that, and kind of talked with some of the earlier speakers about the supply and demand. You know, people love dogs, they love cats, they want pets. How do you envision people getting those pets in you know your ideal universe? You mean in terms of running out of pets? Not that we would run out of pets, but you know, if if say all breeders were these sort of you know small, loving, we treat the pets better than we treat our kids, kind of you know what we would like to think of the you know where they would come from, you know, then the cost goes up, then it becomes maybe kind of like a luxury item, you know, maybe not everybody has access to a pet, maybe it becomes a class issue, you know, how where do where where do all of the pets come from in your ideal mind? Well, I mean, in my in my mind, I don't think that's ever going to be an issue because I think we, there are millions, literally millions of pets out there. There are still people who are not spaying. They are not neutering. There are going to be puppies floor, and there, there always will be. There will always be breeders that, for the love of the breed, will continue to breed. I mean, I, I and maybe I'm being naive about that. I don't see that that's ever going to be an issue. And in my world, yes. I don't want to make the mills better because there's no way to make them better. Well, and I just want to jump in on one thing because you were saying that you know that, that if somebody was doing small scale like you know like hobby breeding, that the price would be exorbitant. But but those people aren't breeding as a livelihood. Right, so, but you'd have to have so many more of those kinds of breeders than exist now to meet the current. But, but right now we're killing millions of animals every year. Even if we took a one year moratorium on breeding. Right. Just to try to find homes for the ones that are alive, we would barely make a dent to the ones that are killed every year. So we're just, if we could clear out all of the shelters, you don't think there's any universe in which we could clear out all of the shelters and control breeding at all? In our lifetimes? I, I don't know. I, that's why I'm asking. I, I don't know. Not in my lifetime. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't ever see that. 
I don't mean, see us running out of power. Ever. Ever. And, and I, I really have had, had somebody ask me that question before. I said, what if we run out of dogs? Really? Because I'm, I'm not saying that we would run out of dogs. I'm just wondering, you know, if you could control all of the circumstances, you know, what what would that look like? Because it doesn't seem to me that you know, kind of irresponsible breeding of people who are not spaying or neutering their pets and you know just kind of dumping dogs in shelters continually is a really great picture either. So I didn't know if there was you know more of an end game you know after the the puppy mill issue. You know what what are the next Next well, step you know, that. We're, we're, all, we're actually working on the premise that this, we will get rid of all the puppy mills at one time, which is never going to happen either. You know, it's not going to be like, oh, okay, tomorrow all the puppy mills get closed down. I don't, I don't see, oh my God, that would be the best day of my life, you know, but if that's not going to happen either. And, and, and I don't think the backyard breeders, I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a men different mentality of the people that you're dealing with in the mills. I mean, I, it would take another hour for me to explain that whole deal. But I don't think you're going to see these exorbitant prices going up from a guy who didn't spay his poodle or something. I, I just don't, I don't think that's realistic in my world. I think, and I can speak to this a little bit from the perspective of this city. Um, what we basically, either, what we basically said is, there is, um, there's only, there's, you can only build a perfect world so much, right? You'll never, I'll never be able to prevent someone from beating their children um, or, or dumping sewage into a creek. But there are ways that we can't eliminate adverse incentives. And so there is, there is too much of an incentive right now to breed in mass and make huge amounts of money on it. Um, and sell that product to people who are simply, they're just not in a position to be educated about the conditions of where their animals came from. Um, so by, well, there's, you know, I think that there will always be supply to meet demand. Um, the benefit of taking dogs out of a retail setting um, that came from breeders, from large scale breeders, is that you limit impulse buys, right? You don't have, a, that's the number one thing that we've heard from people. I, I walked by this pet store, I saw this dog, I wanted to save it from its cage. It was so sad, I took it home, um, and it ended up dying within five days. I spent the next five years fighting to get my money back. Not because I was even so concerned about the money, but because I was so upset that this had happened to something that quickly became a member of my family. Um, the other thing that we saw was that the dogs that were coming from responsible breeders weren't all that much more expensive and maybe aren't ex more expensive at all no, than no. the dogs that are coming out of some of these pet stores. We heard uh, a testimony about pet stores selling dogs for $4,000. I mean, I just can't. That's <laughs> my, so my question of... is not at all, you know, push back on, you know, the puppy mills. I, I'm not supporting that at right. all. I'm just kind of wondering what, what an ideal situation is for companion animals generally. And, yeah. also, and then the other thing that I think that you, that you can establish with at least eliminating the middleman, at least eliminating that really pretty picture that you walk by on the street, is that you, you you put consumers directly in contact with the person who uh, bred the animal. And there are some advantages in that because that allows that person to exercise their independent judgment. There is no fancy showroom. There is any, the benefit of any time someone goes directly to the source. Has anybody, has anybody come up with a number as to how much money is really being burned, generated, through this whole puppy mill situation, how much is it? How much is the industry worth? Multi-billion dollar industry. Billion or billion? Billion. Like what? Ten billion? Twenty billion? I don't know today. <clears throat> I don't know. I can't give you that exact number, but it it's it's big bucks, you know. And that and that's you know it's it's money over morals. Of course it is, you know. And it's and we're fighting. A big fight. You have the puppy mill lobbyists. You have the farm girl sticking their nose in. I mean, we've had 
the NRA snooping around because it is the mentality of first they come for your puppies, then they come for your cows, <laughs> and then they come for your guns. guns. And they did it in Missouri, who's also my gun. part of this lawsuit. And, and, and that is, that <coughs> is a campaign of fear that they have. But I would, I would like to uh, address, if I may, the fact, and I hear it time and time again um, from some of our adversaries, so we shall say, um, closing the stores is not going to make a dent in the puppy mills. That is absolutely not true. Because I can tell you, because we worked long and hard on the pet stores in this city, and we protested, and we got the numbers, and we found out where every dog in this city came from, every dog we could track, and the numbers that came in. From one broker in Iowa, who really supplied 90% of the dogs in this city, one broker in Iowa, if we either got the pet stores in Chicago to go humane, or if they chose to go out of business, you are talking about literally thousands upon thousands of dogs coming into this city every year and being sold. And in my mind, that translates to thousands of dogs that maybe could have been adopted that are going to go down at animal care and control. Because what also happens when people buy these dogs in the pet stores and they get sick? They can't afford it because they've just laid down three grand, or they, they have credit for you in the pet stores now. That's really the best. And, and I can tell you that we, we got um, an email from people who bought a dog at, at Petland, a $4,000 mini bulldog. What is a mini bulldog? And um, two weeks later, that dog was dead, and they put it on credit. They spent $4,500 in the interim in two weeks to keep that dog alive. So now, they've got it on the credit card, the people are still paying off the vet bills, the dog is dead, the kids are devastated, I, and I'm not pulling to heartstrings, this is a true story, and this is the stuff we hear every single day. I can't even tell you how much we hear. So to, so to say to me that closing down the pet stores is not going to help, it is supply and demand. That's exactly what it is. If people don't go in that pet store because now they're educated and they don't want to turn that money over to this pet store who the next week after that dog is sold is going to have a replacement pet. And that truck is going to come into Chicago with 43 puppies stuffed in the back of it on the way to the pet stores. Maybe they'll all make it. Maybe they won't make it. They write it off as a loss because the Animal, Animal Welfare Act doesn't require water for 12 hours for these little teeny tiny puppies. And we had that happen in the city of Chicago two years ago when a truck was pulled over in Pilsen with 43 dogs in the back. And <laughs> that's another old story, but this is what happens. So you go in that pet store, and let me tell you, you put that money right in the pocket of that miller. That's exactly what's going to happen. So closing the pet stores? Yeah. Or having the pet stores go humane, you bet that's going to take a big chunk out of the mills. And I am here to tell you that the millers are feeling it already. They are plenty scared. A lot, lot more mills have closed at this point than when I started. Well, and can you just address one thing, Carrie? Is because it's when when I was at the city of Chicago, we had two pet stores that started pulling animals from us. What's been your experience with the ones that are actually pulling rescued animals? Because they're making a little less money, but I assume that they're getting a lot more goodwill. Well, my, my shining star, which is out in Naperville, um, he went humane um, after a little discussion we had on the phone. And he said, not possible, not possible, I can't get dogs from anywhere. I said, give me 15 minutes and I'm getting you a rescue. Well, last year he adopted out 300. Wow. His goal for this year is 500 animals. He sleeps at night, ask him, he sleeps at night. Does he make the money on these animals? No, that's not how he's doing it. And, and he just bought the building is in, P.S. He makes the money because now he's got a new customer, because these are rescue dogs. They're buying food, they're buying collars, they're buying toys, they're telling their friends who are coming in and buying, and, and, and they're adopting more dogs or, or more cats. This guy is a happy guy, and it can be done, and we've seen it done before. And we've seen how many pet stores in the city of Chicago alone, or Chrysler's, if you all know Chrysler's. We started out, one guy, not a corporation, with one pet store. He's got stores, 12, 14 stores, Las Vegas, 
Beverly Hill. He's living in Beverly Hills now. And I mean, never ever sold an animal in his life. So it requires work. And here's the difference. When you have a pet store and you sell dogs or cats, the way you work is you pick up the phone and you say to your broker or the miller, I need six poos, six cockapoos, or seven doodles, and this is what I need, and I want a chocolate, and a, here's my shopping list. They're a personal shopper, like if you went to Neiman's to buy a purse, I need a red purse. This is what they do, and this is how these guys work. I need them, and they'll be delivered in that truck on Tuesday. And the days go by, and those little dogs are adopted, and another phone call. This is what I need. This is their work ethic. So now, if they have to go humane and work with rescues or shelters, they got to put a little bit more work into it. They have to search for these places to work with them, and they may have to put good dog food or cat food or, or toys into their store. So it's a whole other mentality that they're not used to. But it does, it works. The humane model works. And changing the pet stores over or passing the ordinance, it works and it will work. I'm done. <laughs> I got no time. I got more, but I got no time. I can't. I can't hold up the trick. Um, so um, I am cooking up the very tail end. There's very little left to say, and I really am very honored to be on a panel with these two women who did the heavy lifting. Um, and I'm also very excited the fact that Susanna Mendoza has championed such fantastic legislation. She and my boss Tom Dart is a sheriff worked together in Springfield and did some amazing work for animals when they were in Springfield. So it's great to see that in her role as the clerk that she's doing the same thing here. Um, so briefly, I just want to tell you, so in my role at the county, um, I'm coming in on, this, on the very tail end, um, but the, the um, county ordinance is being challenged. It was in federal court this morning. Um, there, we set a briefing schedule. Um, the case is due back up again on the 15th of December. In the meantime, the plaintiff has the opportunity to respond or amend their complaint. The judge hinted um, at uh, um, kind of the way he's going to go on two of the five counts. The five counts in the complaint were, um, and this is all in federal courts, with commerce, equal protection, preemption, vagueness, and contracts. And the judge said something to the effect of, to the plaintiff, well, you know you can't get around preemption and commerce. So I assume that they are not going to amend that part of the complaint. I think that they're going to realize that that's kind of, those are some losing arguments. Um, but I think they're, they're going to try to argue the other ones. My personal feeling is um, the county is very well represented from the state's attorney, Jamin Avery. I think he is extreme. I, I'm amazed at how um, well versed on this topic he has become in five weeks. Um, and he is quite uh, quite articulate on the topic. I am, I'm sure no small part. From that thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's gotten an earful from Carrie. And um, but. Um, I do think that the ordinance will stand. I think that it will be upheld. I think that, it, that there is a rational basis. I don't think, I think the, the claims are really, I mean, I think it's a stretch. I mean, to say that, that the words humane society are vague, I think is, is kind of silly. There's, there are numerous places in state law that they are referenced. The Humane Care for Animals Act, the Animal Welfare Act, other places. So to say that, that, that you know, we can't possibly understand what's meant by that because the Amish are, according to the plaintiff, a humane and a society, meaning a community, Therefore, aren't the Amish a humane society? I mean, that's just, it, that, I, think, I think at some point it just becomes silly. And this is a very intelligent, very sophisticated judge. I, I, I think that some of the other claims are going to really fall by the wayside. So, um, very excited to follow this piece of legislation, or this uh, litigation rather, and um, certainly we'll know more on the 15th. So, so any questions? How are, how are the Chicago and Cook County ordinances different? They're pretty similar. They're pretty similar. I, think, I think the, the issue was three years ago. Yeah, um, it's, there is a, this, the Chicago ordinance allows the sale of animals from uh, humane societies or non for profits, basically, mm -hmm. period, at the end of it. Um, Cook County's, it said, has the same and then also allows the sale of animals that come from a uh, facility with five or fewer breeding females. So it allows a little more information there. Karen, your research has done a lot of work on this. You're very knowledgeable. Have you come across? Can you, do you have Carrie? Uh, Carrie? The, yes, sir. The Public Project. Have you run across any um, commercial 
breeding facility, a, a large one. You know, not the, we're not talking about the backyard breeders. Mm -hmm. They felt, you know, they uh, they do a good job with um, with their operation. You know, they you know, they do take individual care. Um, do they exist, or is it pretty much, you know, in your opinion, all the large scale operations are public, and they should be eliminated? They are commercial breeding facilities. They are there to breed profit over the care of the animals. I mean, there are breeding facilities for fourteen hundred dogs. How do you walk fourteen hundred dogs? How do you take care of fourteen hundred dogs? How many people do you think you would need to take care of fourteen hundred dogs correctly, humanely, let's say? These are dogs that I have a mill dog, I can tell you what's involved, that has lived eight <coughs> years. Eight years in a middle sized puppy mill. They never have enough staff. There's no way to, do. how can you do this? They're, they're supposed to have vet care once a year. What do you have vet care once a year? What happens in that year? It, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. There's nothing humane about a commercial breeding facility of these dogs. Because the requirements are so slim to none. And they can't even adhere to those. That is the most amazing thing. Have you tried banning the breeders? Have you what? Have you tried banning large-scale operations? Banning? Federal, yeah, federal level is probably not realistic, but state state level. So, you know, we have these 38 state laws. None of them ban the breeders. You, you know? mean ban the mills from coming into our state? Just ban the oh, operations? Oh, uh, that's my, I love it. Yeah. You, I mean, never never, never you never know. You never know what's on the agenda. But, but, you know, and I, and I think it's great. I think the same kinds of things we've been talking about. I mean, you know, Illinois is an agricultural state. So, you know, I remember talking to Sarah Feigen once about when she was trying to get a dog and daycare bill passed in Springfield, and they they were laughing at her like, well, what, what, what dog and daycare? So, I mean, I think that the idea in in Illinois of saying, hey, we're going to eliminate large scale breeding, does come on the heels of Illinois has a big pork producers. I mean, even the, the former head of the Illinois Department of Diet, Sean Harkey, was the former president of the, of the Illinois pork producers. So. And a lobbyist for the pet store, right? Right. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Well, he worked on, you know, he worked against the disclosure bill. So, in theory, there's also kind of a cost shifting, I think, that's involved here. So the states that breed the animals and benefit financially, economically from breeding the animals aren't necessarily where um, the, they're not where the dogs are going to end up. So the costs are borne by Chicago, by Cook County, by these residents um, that are that are separate from and distant from where the actual economic benefit is. So if I walked into Missouri and I said, shut down your, your mills, it's really hurting Chicago's consumers, they would laugh me out of the state house. Mm -hmm. uh, or move to Indiana. <laughs> no, I mean, and that's what they do. If, if the heat is on in one state, and some, some, some of the laws that have been passed, they just pick up and they go. Pennsylvania cracked down on some things and then back, double backed on something. They moved to upstate New York in the beautiful Finger Lakes region where you have a whole Amish community. It's, it's, it's very involved, it's huge, it's like an onion and every time you peel a layer back, you find something else. It's very political and above all, it is it's cruelty. It is large-scale cruelty. So sometimes in my naivety, still, after all this, I still can't believe that anybody could come out against it about making lives better for these dogs. I, I, I just, I can't believe it. And we get it all the time with this nonsense that comes, people, and now the lemon, well, you have the lemon law. The lemon law is good for how long? And if that dog gets sick after the duration of the lemon law, which is what a mill dog probably will do. You don't see these issues right when they're three weeks old, or you've had them for three weeks. Then what? Then what's the recourse? I mean, I, I, we have stories, I, I, I really, like this, and they're still coming in from the pet stores and these people that have bought these dogs. And what it does <coughs> to these families, and it's consumer fraud. If I know where my cantaloupes are coming from, I better well darn know where the next member of my family is coming from, and I want to know the truth. And you don't get the truth when you go into a pet store. 
Doesn't it begin with a consumer who wants a perfect purebred dog and thinks that he or she can only get it at a, a dog at a uh, pet Somet store? Yeah, sometimes. How do you does. how do you change that mindset? Because ah. Sometimes you don't because Well, if you, you don't know. change that mindset, you're not going to break some Well, are you? you're right, but but here's the thing, you know, it's education and this is what we're all about. I mean, I can give you statistics. 43% of Americans do not know that those pet store puppies come from puppy mills. Okay? 43% don't know about that. However, 1 in 5, 17% still choose to purchase at a local pet store and to save a life. And that is mostly between 18 and 34 year old. Sure. We have um, a society that says, I want it and I want it now. And that's something that you've got to break through. The hardest thing for me is that I know that there is going to be a community of people that don't care, that will do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And I have no sympathy at this point in my life for somebody who says to me, her dog is so sick and blah, blah, blah. I know I shouldn't have done it, but it was so cute. Okay. You were right the first time, you shouldn't have done it. And they know it, and they do it anyway. So part of our, a big thing that we do is education. We are out there everywhere. We've done billboards and bus ads, and we go everywhere we can to educate and to speak from preschool through college. But I do see the winds of change, I do. I see it now, there's no question. I would also add to this that I do think that there, that people try to assume that if it's allowed, it's safe, so the fact that, that cocaine yep. was legal for years and years and years, um, society well, just, just, yeah, yeah. just assumed it was safe. So <laughs> there, is, there is that component, too, by shutting that down and saying, hey, this isn't what you think it is. It helps the education process. It's all about raising awareness. So if you make it illegal to uh, sell puppies at company puppy mills, like what do the pet stores do with the puppies that they already have that came to Oh, they'll sell them. They no, and, and, and they always sell them. Sell the, the, or, the ordinance provided for a window of time. The Chicago ordinance was a year. The county ordinance was six months. So with the whole idea that then, it, just like if anything else, if, if we ban foie gras, if we ban anything else, you can sell down your, your inventory of it and not order more. You know, it's interesting because we were having this conversation, uh, an attorney from, from Commissioner Fritchie's office and the, a, the assistant state attorney and I just, we were talking this morning um, about the fact that, I mean, it really is about sourcing, it's not about puppies. And, and so if, and I, so I believe this is really irrational, rationally related to a government, a, a legitimate government interest, that if, if the county board were to say, you know, we're not going to allow the sale of apparel from um, places where, you know, it's using child labor, and in unsafe conditions, I, I believe that that's, that is a legitimate ordinance that would be upheld. It doesn't say that people can't sell apparel. It says you can't source it using these places. So it's the same, to me it's the same, it's the same analogy that, that it really comes down to how, you know, where are these animals coming from. You can sell the animals, that's not a problem. So. They just put them on sale and they'll always sell. Could you ever get away with banning puppies? sale of puppies, period. So in other words, they would have to be dogs, got to be on a certain age before they could be purchased. Yeah, I don't think we've looked into that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, because seriously, that's the other thing. People want a, quote, little puppy yeah, they that don't they can grow they and grow, grow with, rather than dealing with a, uh, a, you know, a dog that's two or three or four years old. Yeah, but, but where, I mean, where would you, how would you, how would you even do that? Where I'm not saying you can't, like? but it seems to me that that would take care of the issue of uh, discriminating with these owners and things, I would think. But I obviously, you know. That'd be a tough thing. Yeah. I think it's a lot of loose ends on that one. I mean, most of the dogs at the CAC are adult dogs, aren't they? Mostly. And, and those are the ones you're trying to get into the population. So how are you going to get those in the population if people want puppies? That's the problem. But, but that, they're, they're, I mean, I should go back to the government of education. I mean, you know, I mean, you couldn't pay me to have a puppy. You could not pay oh, me to have yeah. a kitten. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't pay me. I mean, but it's, it's trying to explain to people that, you know, it's like having a toddler. So, you know, I remember bringing one super, super cute puppy from down home from, from animal control one day. This it was like a newfie puppy. Literally, there was no cuter dog on the planet. I thought, oh, I just can't stand thinking of her in a cage. So I brought her home, and I thought, oh, this is so tempting, it's so tempting. And she started carrying my shoes around. I was like, that's right, you're a puppy, and I'm not home. 
And it's like, you know what, let her be the family where somebody has more time. I mean, this I will, I will create a monster dog because I'm never home to take care of a dog. So it's a good thing my dog is 10 and sleeps all day. Lucy probably not so bad. Not so bad. <laughs> any final questions? Any final questions? Great program. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I want to let everyone know that our next event will be on November 5th. It's an Aldiff Saldiff meet and greet. We'll be on the seventh floor of this building. Um, it's a happy hour. It's a, it goes from 5:30 to 7:30. Okay. November 5th on Wednesday. If you you look at the emails I've been sending you constantly under the upcoming events, there's a link to an Eventbrite site where you can register for it. Uh, if you need a CLE, please uh, come up and I'll give it to you. Um, I'll take your evaluation forms and thank you all for coming.